It really was an exhausting adventure. It wasn't difficult by any means, but it was long and quite boring. Kane had come up with something he called a multi-track adventure in the void. And he had forced everyone into this train that he had created. Every character got their own card. There was a buffet wagon and other distractions to go around. But what was most entertaining here in the void train were the strange creatures that were randomly generated by Kane as its journey continued. But there was more to see and more to experience, such as the occasional halts to refill on coal. There were multiple, though sadly often repeated, designs for refueling stations where you and the other characters could take a short break and walk around a little. No one knew why Kane was suddenly so obsessed with trains. And truthfully, no one really cared. It was a change of pace, despite it slowly but steadily becoming the new normal and very stale. And normal in the digital circus meant mind-numbing sensory overload without anything to do or experience. You awoke out of dreamless slumber staring blankly at the ceiling of your cart. The lights moving past the window. They were mostly red today. This was really the only way to tell the time here. The change in colors of the outside. Yesterday it had been green. And the day before that, a blue fog that managed to seep into the wagons. That also was your adventure for the day. It was a nightmare, really. Kinga thought he was abstracting because of his, quote, funky vision, and Jax had spent the entire day jumping out at Gaggle from the fog. But you managed. Not like you left your bed often. Luckily, though, you didn't need to leave it. In the digital void, which included, well, the void... And of course, the train, no one felt hunger. Eating was just something done to feel the sensation of it and the comfort of feeling full. Sleep was not required either. It was just something done to skip the time. Not that dreams were a thing here anyways. But most importantly, you could see outside a window here. That was a big change for you. And you could experience the one thing that was truly magical about the digital world. The kaleidoscope that was the void. A surprisingly pleasant change for you. Though sadly you weren't allowed outside into the void, as your new body was quite attracted to light and you'd definitely get lost if you allowed yourself to be taken over by your body's carnal instincts. So you just lie back down, staring at the ceiling, waiting. Kane probably would have another adventure planned. And a few times you got to skip it by sleeping. So maybe if you concentrated really, really hard on just lying here with closed eyes, you would be forgotten again. It was a good thing your card was at the other end of the train as well lowering the chances even more. But all your hopes and dreams were crushed when the door to your sleeping quarter was kicked open. Hey, Tip Top, we need your assistance. You blushed as you immediately jumped out of bed. Tip Top was your name in the digital world. And you had the body of an anthropomorphic moth. Your shoulders, chest, and most of your back were covered in light pink puffy fur. White chitin with orange glowing highlights covered the rest of your body. Surprisingly soft and sleek 
more like a springy silicone rather than a hard shell. Two antennas came out of her head. They were super sensitive to vibrations, making you feel every sound around you. Honestly, with them, you could be stuck in the dark, and by feeling how the sound vibrated, you could imagine the rough layout of a room. It was pretty useful. Your face, luckily, was quite humanoid. Yeah, sure, you had a big, bulbous clown nose, and your eyes were completely jet black, but... Eh, human enough. White like the rest of your body. Around your eyes were playing card symbols that too glowed in the dark. Your hair was short and the same soft pink color as your fur. Clothes weren't really needed for you, but since a special encounter with another character, Jax. You wore thigh-high socks with some padding in them. Your toes were quite sharp. So were your hands, but you had more control over them. You blushed from ear to ear as you looked at the bunny man. How, oh, uh, what do you need from me? You asked. You're the only one who can get under the train and check out what's causing an issue. Disappointed, you let your shoulders hang. Oh. Jax was special to you. Not because of his borderline disgusting attitude or his unique personality. No. You had slept with him in the last part a few days ago. He never brought it up again and you quite frankly were completely and utterly embarrassed to even look at him. What? Do you need me for then? Jax shrugged. You know, cane stuff. Jax made finger guns, which means adventure stuff, and we need your unique set of skills. Reluctantly, you got out of bed, draping your wings around your body like a rope before following Jax outside. The train had an empty, unroofed cart in between each functioning wagon to allow for more visibility if something interesting happened outside. In front of your card were the other characters. All were looking quite annoyed. Notice something, barked Zubal, as if this entire situation was your fault. Uh, what's going on? You said, rubbing your eyes. It was quite bright outside. The train isn't moving. You bit your lower lip. You really didn't see why that was your fault. Kinger then shoved his hand on Zubel's face. Ah, uh, allow me to elaborate. Zubel groaned, annoyed. Kane has noticed a certain, um, lack in participation on your end. So he added a new creature into the void. He pointed into the vast ocean of clashing colors. He calls them Goo Goo Blues. They're these insects that attach to the train wheels and stop them entirely. You blinked, still not really sure what you were supposed to do about it. Kinger made a wing motion with his detached hands. So he wants you to swoop around the train and pull them off. You took a frightened step back. But my wings don't work. You deflected. My body is too heavy. Not to mention you still had a human brain inside your head. You quite literally were incapable of moving your wings, as your brain wasn't made to do so. It took you an incredible amount of effort and focus to even fold these wings to a rope or stretch them out. You had only tried flapping them once, and the strain on your brain was so great, you started glitching out a little. The void has no gravity. You can flap them and, and move. No one else really can. You cross your arms reluctantly. 
I... I don't... If you don't, we're stuck. And if we abstract in the train, that, um... That leads to disaster. Please, I don't want to abstract. Ugh, you really had to, huh? You kind of had to agree. Stepping to the edge of the train cart, you look down into the endless abyss. Just barely you could make out a wiggling neon red tail. Probably one of the... What were they called? Goo Goo Blues? You turn around only to see Jax with his foot raised, ready to kick you into the void. Ugh, seriously, Jax? You deadpanned. He chuckled. <laughs> well, might as well give you a little assistance, you know. I, I'd like a rope so I don't drift off too far. I mean, if I get a few wheels unstuck, it surely will go forward again. Even if it's slowly at first. That's... <gasps> Why didn't we think of that first? Shouted Kinger, excited. Out of her cart, Ragatha now brought a rope which she gingerly secured around your hip after you spread out your wings. And then you slowly and carefully allowed yourself to step out of the gravitation bubble of the train. God, she's so hot. What's her problem, anyways? Muttered Zubo quietly towards Gaggle, once you were out of view. I wish I had wings. Jax, in the meantime, insisted he'd hold the rope, which worried everyone, including you. You managed to painfully flap your wings to reach the underside of the train. Every time you moved, your wings, your vision blurred a little, and the only good thing about this was that there was nothing. No resistance from the air, as the void was quite literally the absence of it. Thank God, in the digital world, you didn't need to breathe. Slowly, carefully, you maneuvered under the train. And finally, you saw one of the Goo Goo Blues. The creatures looked like long, thick, red leeches made out of shiny rubber. While outwardly cute with their big, googly eyes, as you pulled them off the train, you saw into their gross mouths. They were covered in hundreds of layers of teeth to quite literally bite into the train's metal. Your right eye twitched in disgust as you looked at the thing wiggling in your claws. Unsure if you should just squish it and kill it, or just let it go. Oh god. You hoped Cain didn't make you kill them. As gross as they were, you couldn't do it. But after you let go of the thing, it immediately shot away into the void. Making you sigh in relief. Even if you didn't have to kill them, the entire process was still slow. But luckily, it was steady. The leech light Goo Goo Blues were difficult to pull off, but once off, they were essentially gone. The problem were the bigger ones. They required you to grab the tail with both hands and pull with your feet against the train's bottom. Once they popped off, you always shot downwards, and you could always hear Jack's complain every time you did it. After pulling out a quite thick leech, the train slowly began to roar, and it moved again. Now everything became more difficult, as you had to climb using all the nooks and crannies of the train's underside. It took you the entire day with a rapidly speeding up train above you, to remove the Google Blues. 
Though lucky, by the end of it, it seemed as if the momentum you had built up together with the machine was roughly the same. So while you could see that you were moving, it didn't feel like you were. That was good. Carefully, you now climbed to the top of the train. Seeing the long rope reaching over the train's roof. Carefully walked on top of it until jumping down to the others. Great job, shouted Kinger. But as everyone seemed to want to pat your back, minus Jax, you felt embarrassed. This was something you had to do, wasn't it? With your new body, you just hated it when people looked at you. You hated your appearance. It was so inhuman and you found it gross. It made you hate being praised. Though just as you opened your mouth to protest, Kane popped into view above you and the others. Good job, Tip Top! He shouted excitedly. You managed to get the train unstuck! He pointed his cane at you. So you get to choose your reward. It can be anything. It you can be as creative as you want. Just know it is always up to my interpretation. Ah. Uh, you blinked. The selfish side of you wanted to ask to leave, but you knew that would only lead to Kane making a door that led to the exit maze. Well, I'm hungry. Ask for a good meal, Jack said with a shrug. I'd like to see an insect collection. Ugh, everyone, shut up, shouted Ragatha as she gently pecked you on the back. Go with whatever you think is right. Be creative. Doesn't always happen that Cain lets you choose. You had made up your mind and asked for a key. The key to the lunch cart. The wagon in question was in the middle of the train and was only open from 12 p.m. to 3 p.m. Impressed, Jack clapped his hands. Now with a key in hand, a 24-7 all-you-can-eat buffet was ready to be devoured at any time. That was the best choice for a reward you could possibly have made. Eating now was on the time killer list again for everyone. You sighed, sitting down on your bed. You were breathing slowly. Your heart was still going so fast. It had been too much excitement for one day. Having everyone around you for so long was unneeded eyes on you. And all that flapping had made your wings go stiff. You couldn't even wrap them around you anymore. Sniffing, you lie down in bed. Though, just as you closed your eyes, you heard the noise of keys turning at your room's door. Gulping, you sat up. Hey there, Tip Top. It's me again. It was Jax. Your heart jumped. Slamming the door behind himself, he approached you. Just, uh, wanted to thank you for the key. To my room? I don't remember. He blinked. Oh, no, I took that one myself. I'm talking about the food cart. That was awesome of you. He stopped in the middle of your room with his hands in his pockets. Uh, yep, <sighs> pretty awesome. It seemed like he was waiting for something. Expectantly, you tilted your head. Man, here yeah, I thought you'd immediately tear the clothes off my body as soon as we were private. You blushed. Oh, uh oh, you shuddered. I didn't realize that's why you were here. What? Did you really think I'll leave it as a one-time thing? 
He shrugged smugly. <laughs> what? What is there? Gaggle? He burst out into laughter as he imagined it. After all, she was the only one insecure enough to not say no if he asked. Plus, he already knew your body. In and out. Literally and figuratively. And he was quite attracted to that. It maybe helped you in accepting your mirror image as well in the long run. So it was a win-win regardless. He blinked. Huh. He didn't realize there was a single caring bone in his body. Maybe this was a mistake. But before he could reconsider, you had already sat up, even putting down your blanket. <sighs> Damn, Zopa was right. Maybe it was the digital world screwing with what he was attracted to, but you were in fact pretty hot. Even with that clown nose of yours. I mean, if you want to, I, I won't stop you. You chuckled, smiling slightly at him. Nice, he thought. With one hand, he unhooked one of his overall binders as he came closer. With it just barely hanging from his shoulder, he stopped right in front of you. Jax gently took hold of your face, making you look up at him. He smiled as your eyes met. But you just barely managed to contain your excitement. But as you enjoyed the moment, you realized he was pulling your leg right now. As it dawned on you, you noticed his grin slowly widening. You narrowed your eyes. Are you screwing with me? He didn't answer, but you deadpanned regardless. You knew exactly what he wanted to say. You knew exactly what he was thinking, and... Ugh, don't... You sighed. I haven't even done anything yet. You narrowed your eyes. And you now stood up. He was still a little taller than you. So it wasn't as threatening as you wanted it to be. Still, you were now very close to his face. Well, aren't you going to kiss me? He chuckled. <laughs> maybe. Or maybe I just longingly look into your eyes a little more. You're not going to kiss me first, are you? You want me to do it? He exhaled. <sighs> no. No, I don't think so. <sighs> Haven't I done enough yet? He shrugged. I was holding the rope. You dead, Pen. Sighing, you placed your hands on the shoulders. <sighs> You're hopeless. His hands wrapped around your hips, gently rubbing circles into you, making you gasp. Aren't we all? He purred. Come on. Put that honey tube of yours in my mouth. I know you want to. You may have a human face, but in place of a tongue, you had a tube like appendage. It still allowed you to taste, like a regular tongue, of course, but it also allowed you to drink things, like through a straw. And it always secreted a spittle that smelled and tasted like honey. And since last time, Jax had developed a taste for it. And so... You obliged. It was you who closed the distance to the rabbit's lips, gently kissing him, 
making the neurons in your brain fire in delight. Gently he pushed forward until you lost your balance, landing on your bed with a quiet palm. You exhaled through your nose a quiet hum, feeling his familiar weight on you for such a long time. It was breathtakingly wonderful. It was then you allowed your tongue to push past his lips and teeth. Jax's ears perked up excitedly as the sweet nectar ran down his throat. His hands slowly went up the sides of her body. And you didn't mind it. Bending your knees, you locked him in place with your thighs. You wanted to say something, but that would mean you'd have to separate. And I was out of the question. You were enjoying it too much. His tongue was sliding up and down yours. Jack sucked and slurped. It felt so good. Your eyes rolled back. Though then he suddenly pulled away. Jack snickered, swiping away some of the golden liquid from his lips. Right. Is what I'm doing gay? He was joking. And offended, you puffed up your cheeks. Angrily, you grabbed his wrist, placing it right on your fluffy chest. He blushed as he groped at what he was feeling. Does this feel gay? Nope. That feels very feminine. And I, um can feel my brain cells going bye-bye every second I'm not inside you. <sighs> Finally, you gasped as you undid the last button on his overall. <laughs> you really are such a freak. I like that. There was a new character among your kind. A small, adorable jester named Pomni. She was still getting used to her new situation and the others were having a blast getting her used to it. All but you. As you felt for her. You really did. But you just couldn't look at her. Every time you saw a new character forced into the digital circus, it was like reliving your own first few days. And every time you did it, it got worse. Though you had given up on finding an exit long, long ago, every time just someone mentioned it, or Kane placed a door leading to a section of the circus called the exit, even though it wasn't, you felt a deep pit of despair open inside your gut. And it was super difficult to cope with your situation. You weren't twitchy like Kinger, or overstimulated like Gragatha, or overwhelmed like Pomni. But more, you were in a state of deep seated deadness. In your demeanor and thought pattern. You could hide it quite well when among the others. But when you were alone, in your overly cutesy pink room with all the frills, bows and teddies, you couldn't handle it. In the digital circus you had been given a new form like anyone else. That was unconventionally adorable in its own weird way. Your name here was Squig, chosen by lettered tarot cards 
Cain had summoned when you first arrived. You were a small green goblin creature with long ears out of which white fluff was growing. Your hair was short and black, just long enough to cover half of your face. Your eyes yellow, teeth were sharp and white. Your small stature was also quite stretchy. After every meal you could see it in an almost comfy, bulging, round belly that after a few hours would just go away. And you are dressed up in a red, relatively tight and adorable clown outfit. You had arrived as a sort of Christmas special character to spice up the Christmas adventure and Cain refused to give you anything to do unless it actually was Christmas. Which made you a simple tag-along if you happened to be present by the time a new show was on the road. But once it was Christmas, you always were rudely awoken out of your slumber and put up by Cain as the antagonist of his Christmas specials. The rest of the time in the digital circus you spend sitting around, either moping or wandering around, opening random doors. Sometimes you are crying and screaming, and sometimes you are just sitting there in your bedroom, like right now. Because there was one thing, one beautiful thing that Ragatha had given you, small piece of metal that just fit in your palm. She had given it to you after your first breakdown. She had pet you on the head all night. She explained that when you go crazy in this place you glitch out and abstract. Turn into a large, well, abstract blob creature with hundreds of eyes. She explained it so casually, it honestly frightened you even more. But then she said, You should see this sheet of metal as a sort of mental compass. Whenever you fell down, you were to bend it. And when you wanted to feel good again, you try your best to make it straight again. You had spent countless hours bending and pulling and squeezing and rubbing the thing the moment she had given it to you. It lurked like an almost divine comfort. However, just now, as you were feeling at your most hopeless while playing with the thing, it clicked and broke into two. At first you held the two pieces in your hands as you stared at them, your ears folding backwards like those of a scared kitten, eyes widening in horror, your mind not able to see this rationally and just getting in your metal sheet. This wasn't good. To you, the sheet was your mental health. It breaking in two, this meant you were going abstract for sure. You were convinced of that. Even though Ragatha had only suggested it to quiet you down all those weeks ago, you had internalized it. You screeched, patting down your own body in reassurance. You weren't glitching. Yet. Panicking, you ran in circles in your room, crying until you tripped over a stuffed toy. And then you sat down on the floor. Your mind was racing, trying to come up with a solution, a quick one at that. And slowly, a devastating decision was forming in your head. If, if you were to abstract, you would just end it yourself, before you could harm anyone. Yes, in that moment that seemed like an incredibly good idea, right now, in your situation. Yes. 
That seemed like an incredibly good idea right now in your situation. In your minds. In your state of being. That you weren't thinking of the logistics behind it. And so determined you got on your feet. Marched over to the pink drawer in this disgustingly pink room of yours and pulled out a long piece of rope you had kept from Pomni. You was about to use it for the same purpose you'd be using it for now. You held the rope tightly in your arms like a precious artifact or child or toy. No one would take this from you. And with quivering lips you entered the long corridor that led into each character's bedroom. After all, there was nothing on your ceiling on which you could attach the rope to. So the balcony overlooking the huge stage area needed to suffice. No one was in the hallways, thankfully. Surely they had stopped you all except for Jax, who would probably just enjoy the show. And so you quickly rushed forward. You fell on your face once or twice in your hurry. The amazing digital circus seeming to bend its own reality to prevent you from reaching the balcony by making the hallways longer. But alas, it wasn't enough. Your determination was too strong. You reached the railing huffing and puffing with a racing heart. You wrapped the road around it, making the tightest knot you could possibly make in your meek form. One satisfied with the tightness, you knotted a noose to hang around your neck, not realizing that, in fact, you still weren't glitching out yet. Happily, you laughed, triumphantly so, and loudly roaring, as if you finally tricked Cain into having some control over your life. You would not abstract today. No, you wouldn't. And ironically, this wish was the reason that, in fact, you were not abstracting right now. You would get out on your own terms. This was the true exit. Laughing maniacally, you climbed on the balcony's railing and jumped. As you were busy ending yourself, Jax was walking through the stage area. He was looking out for some snacks. When he heard, your violent laughter coming from somewhere behind him. The rabbit shrugged. Well, this may kill a couple of minutes, he thought, as he leisurely walked into your direction. And even when he saw your struggling self hanging from the rope, he couldn't help but laugh. <laughs> oh man, Squig, are you serious? He said, mockingly before putting a hand next to his mouth and shouting up at you. We all tried this before. Well, except for me, of course. He lied. He definitely tried it. It's not gonna work. You were clasping the rope around your neck with both of your tiny hands as you coughed and gurgled. I can see that, Jax! He sighed with a wide grin. It's fine. I'll get you down in a second. With his hands in his pockets, he slumped over to the stairs, leading up to the balcony and the living quarter hallway. However, as he reached your hanging rope, he put his arms on the railing, looking down at you mockingly. What are you doing? Let me out of this. You croaked whimpered and hissed as you clawed at the rope. I'm just enjoying the view. Man, the stage area always looks so much bigger from up here. Jax! Okay, okay. <laughs> Fine. He leaned down and pulled at the rope, choking you. 
Jax wasn't gentle in his rescue. The rabbit wanted you to feel every second of your dumb decision. And as you were sitting there, shivering, coughing and rubbing your throat, he took the rope from you. Wow, this is some great craftsmanship. Whoever made it, whoever made it, may want wanted to hang for a very long time. You didn't make this, didn't you? No. You croaked, rubbing your throat. I took it from Pomni so she wouldn't do it herself. I was worried for her. Tisk, tisk, tisk. Aren't we a selfish one? <laughs> a woman after my own making. He petted your head, roughing up your hair in the process. You're such a little devil, huh? Hush, hush! You growled. I'm going to abstract. I was just saving all of you. Jax raised his brows. Jax raised a brow. I'm sure of that. He picked you up, holding you like an oversized, unruly cat. Your pouting face making you look only cuter. You look fine to me. Adorable, in fact. You narrowed your eyes angrily. No, I'm serious. I will abstract. He put you down. Are you sure? Well... Looking at your hands, you puffed up your cheeks. I'm feeling glitchy. Sighing, Jax punted your head with his fist. Are you sure you're not just going insane? He sat down on the balcony railing, watching you as you crawled helplessly on the ground. But I broke it. Broke it? My mind, I broke it. Just now? You nodded. <sighs> That's when Jax remembered the stupid metal sheet. And he burst into laughter, almost falling off the balcony himself. What? Stop mocking me! You, f you seriously thought you'd abstract just from that? You broke out into tears. No, 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 no. If it was that easy, there would be no one left here already. Pomni would have probably abstracted the first moment she saw us. As Jax watched you cry bitter tears, however, he couldn't help himself. Sitting down next to you, he pulled you on top of his lap. If Ragatha can calm you down by petting you, he might as well give it a shot. When no one was watching, at least. And to a surprise, it worked like a charm. Your ears were twitching comfortably while Jax's fingers scratched over your head. <laughs> you really like this, huh? He was weirded out by you and his own body's reaction to this thing he was doing. He was feeling something. It was it pity? Gosh. How was he feeling pity? Jax of all people. Ugh probably had to do with your annoyingly cutesy appearance for Goblin. I can't believe it took you so long to break it in the first place. You do know she said it randomly so you'd calm down, right? You shrugged. You were trying not to purr, especially when he was the one making you feel good. Uh, you know, Squig. I don't think even Ragatha remembers she told you to play with that thing. Are you done? Done with what? Betting you? Thank you, I was getting bored. Puffing up your cheeks, you swiftly grab his wrist, pulling it back down on your head. For him to scratch you. I meant insulting me. <laughs> and I'll keep insulting you. What you just did, that was super dumb. And hilarious. You blushed hard. I wasn't thinking right. But now that you mention it, 
Yeah, it was dumb and selfish. See? Wouldn't we all be happier if everyone just agreed with me, little old Jax? You grumbled reluctantly. Besides, he said with the smuggest of grins. I know an activity that will keep both of us sane. You perked up your ear. And that would be? Jax looked to his left, then to his right. Fun adult stuff. You giggled and blushed hard, rolling on your back. Oh, aren't we a charmer today, Jax? Oh, you just want to take advantage of a little legally aged gobbo who is mentally really vulnerable right now? Yes. Climbing up the bunny man's thighs, you straddled your legs around his narrow waist, your hands pushing against Jack's chest. He just barely reached his chin. What if I say no? You purred. <laughs> you don't look like you're going to. He hushed as his face came closer to yours. Biting your lower lip, you whispered. Kiss me. <laughs> and why would I do that? Do you really want to kiss my mouth after you used me like a flashlight? Jax's eyes widened in surprise. He couldn't believe that the word flashlight wasn't censored. And he blushed. Fair point, but damn. That's, uh... That's a fair point. I uh, must admit. And so the rabbit kissed you. His face locking on your lips. You felt warm and protected as you pressed yourself against him. And it was you who first got a little bolder. As your thighs tightened around his waist, you let your thick tongue pushed past his lips. His teeth were impenetrable, but after you gingerly moved over them with your wet organ, he eventually allowed you passage. His own tongue only touching yours lightly at first. He was teasing you to force you deeper into his throat. Fine by you. And eventually, even he could no longer hold himself back. Too much enjoying the situation. And with you clasping around him, sucking and licking over his tongue like your life depended on it, he stood up, his hands carefully groping your butt as he made his way to his room, fully intending on using you like you had so generously insisted. If there was one thing you hated about the digital circus above anything else, above the annoying NPCs, above the adventures that were unbelievably exhausting, terrifying and painful, or the simple fact that you are essentially stuck in a wacky prison with a weird cartoonish body. It was indescribable. A stale, stagnant air that had some quality in it. Like an AI tried to generate a regular flowing air system but just gave up on the final stretch. It was unnatural. And at worst, in the personal rooms of you and your fellow formerly human characters. Because of that, you spend most of your time in the large stage area. Studying it. Learning all the nooks and crannies. It was a healthy obsession. After all, the only thing that kept everyone from going insane and abstracting in the process was finding things to do. 
while playing your part in the adventures Cain gave out. It was a game of patience with your own head. A world designed to be a sensory overlord 24-7 in a body that wasn't your own. That could break any brain. In the digital circus, you were a sort of werewolf creature. While you were built as a humanoid, you suffered from thick brown fur that covered your entire body. Luckily, you could shave it off. Sadly, the only means to do so was a wood chipper, which you had fallen into during an adventure and learned that this was the best way to trim the fur of your hide. You hid it in your room to prevent Cain from despawning it. You'd cover your hands, lower arms, head and legs in bandages and then throw yourself into it, freeing up your chest, upper arms and thighs. It was incredibly painful. And this simulated act of self-deletion did take a toll on your brain. But it also led to you looking a way you could accept. Your hands were large. And while you didn't have straight up claws, your fingertips were hard and spiky. You had a fluffy tail that swung behind you, and no matter what you tried, you couldn't get rid of it. And since you got rid of most of your fur, you acquired clothes. Which Kane provided in the form of clowny, baggy blue pants with a yellow star pattern, and a half blue, half white armless hoodie. The hood of which didn't fit over your wolf-shaped head. It also came with a golden zipper. This was acceptable, though the fact that you had to throw yourself in a wood chipper on a weekly basis to maintain this look was humiliating. Your name in this world was Zigzag, due to the zigzag shape of your fur. You perched yourself up on one of the giant plastic prop presents in the stage area. From here you got a good look at the countless doors covering the walls. You knew from experience that there were no rules attached to them. Opening them always led to somewhere else. And you were trying to figure out a way to tell where they led without opening them. You had been punched by a glove on a spring way way too many times, and you would never admit to anyone how many times, even though you kept count. It was a total of 387. Your eyes narrowed. You had just spotted the shine beneath one of the doors change. Though as you jumped on the ground and rushed over to the door, opening it led to a punch in the face. Angrily you screamed as you rubbed the side of your muzzle. The sponge had been so hard, if you weren't a denizen of the digital circus, you'd definitely lose at least one tooth. However, your humiliation wasn't over yet, as from behind you, you heard an evil giggle. <laughs> well, 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 look at that. It was Drax. The bunny man was clapping his hands mockingly. Are we trying to reach the exit again? You pouted as well as you could with your dog mouth. Ah, don't make that face. You have good talking, rabbit. You barked and he shrugged. And what does that mean? You just wait for someone else to find it for you. Jack shrugged. Well, if you guys want to be suckers doing all the work for me. You growled. But, but, but. Eh, for once, I'm not here to make fun of your attempts at finding an exit. I'm here to make a proposal. He rubbed his devious hands together. Crossing your arms, you stood there. Yet, your stoic expression was betrayed by your wagging, fluffy tail showing just how intrigued you were by his offer. 
Why, yes, these bodies aren't exactly what I would call appealing. You narrowed your eyes. He just caught you ugly, didn't he? They are durable. To demonstrate, he held up his arm and slammed it down on his knee, breaking it. Though moments later, it returned to its regular form. See? Right, I'm listening. So, here's my proposition. Let's test our durability with a game of spin the bottle with dares. Uh, well, yes, we can do this daily. I'd still call this a once in a lifetime opportunity. You gave him a dangerously toothy grin and a glare. You just want us to get hurt. Maybe. Uh, Ragatha had already said yes to it, so did Palmney and Kinger. You exhaled feeling the group pressure. Fine, I'll participate. But only because I'm bored and I don't want to be punched again. Good girl. Your heart jumped a beat and you looked away. While Jax's grin became smug. Being called a good girl was a great weakness of yours thanks to your new body. It excited it, in a terrible and annoying way. It got unreasonably excited, hot and horny. Even though you kept it to yourself. It was obvious thanks to that tail of yours and the smell of pheromones you exuded in response. That's why Ragatha and the others stopped themselves from saying it, because they understood how embarrassing it was for you, but... Of course, Jax didn't care. In fact, he reveled in it. And he used it as a tool to keep you on a tight leash. You followed Jax into his room, where the others were sitting around an empty bottle. They greeted you with cautious excitement. And you sat down between Ragatha and Palmney. So, everyone, <laughs> I assume you're familiar with the rules? Jack started after a long spiel about the durability of your new bodies and how much of a learning experience this could be. During his explanation, his gaze kept shifting to Kinger and Palmney the most. Kinger was frankly not mentally too stable anymore, not after Queener abstracted at least, and Palmney was the newest member of the group. You gave Ragatha a deadpan look. Her response was an annoyed nod. This was merely a setup for his amusement by torturing Palmley and Kanger. Though there was nothing else to do. Jax then forced himself between you and Ragatha as he took hold of the bottle. He grinned from ear to ear as he spun. It was a knockout game. It would not end until there was one vector left. And after Jack set Kinger on fire and made Palmney jump off the high balcony that led into the stage area, you silently agreed with Ragatha to ruin the game for him. At first you just came up with absolutely terrifying stunts for the rabbit to make, such as walking over a tight rope above the stage area, but... He always just did it, and never hurting himself. And you couldn't just say he opened doors until you had punched. That wasn't fun, and wouldn't make him learn a lesson. But you had to commend Palmney. She was holding up her own, all by she was quite shaken up. After all, by now she had broken and healed multiple bones by now. The worst of all, you and Ragatha need to make punishing dares for Jax's victims, too, so that there was no suspicion of you and the doll working together. During a small break, you and the redhead were sitting in a corner, discussing what to do next. This isn't working, she sighed. We need a plan. We have just been shooting in the dark. 
Crossing her arms, she looked at you. Oh, yeah? I'm guessing you have a proposal, then. Humiliating him. Not by hurting him, but by mentally breaking him. Ragatha raised a curious eyebrow. Something he isn't expecting. The raggedy puppet rubbed her chin and thought. Ladies, hummed Jax as he was getting ready for the next round. And then you closed your eyes. Your ears perked up and it was difficult to keep your tail from wiggling as you did. Ah, I have an idea, you said in a defeated tone. And? You leaned into Ragatha, whispering in her ear, and her cheeks flushed. No, never! What are you two talking about? You know, no teaming up! You hissed. Fine, I'll do it then. You sat back down next to Jax, while Ragatha positioned herself in front of Pomni in the hopes that by giving her less mass to be pointed at, she would get the brunt of Jax's sadism rather than the jester. Jax grabbed a bottle and spun it. Seconds passed as you watched the bottle roll. You could feel your sweat building up. And then it pointed at you. You looked at the rabbit next to you. There was a sadistic gleam in his eyes. As Jax was leaning against the wall, thinking, rubbing his chin, humming playfully. You know what? I think I could go for some seven minutes in heaven. Your heart felt as if it stopped, while the others jumped up in complete and utter shock. Ragatha shrugged at you, but you couldn't help but look away. That was what you had suggested to the doll. The bunny smirked. Uh, you must have listened. Uh, this isn't really a dare, isn't it? Asked Pomni while tapping her fingers together. But no one was paying attention to her. Everyone's eyes were on you. If you said no, you'd be out of the game. But if you said yes, you'd have to go into the closet with him. And though while that may have been your plan in the first place, him saying it, that threw all of your attentions out of the window. Jax leaned in closer to you and whispered, You know, if we stay in there for more than seven minutes, we're both kinda out of the game. Right. Hearing his voice right in your ear made your tail stand up. Fine, it isn't against the rules, you stuttered. Good girl. Damn it. Damn it. You failed. Jax held out his hand, and you took it. It's fine. It's just seven minutes. Jax dragged you into his closet, where the rabbit man immediately pushed you up against the back wall. Well, 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 he hushed smugly. You are stronger than him, easily, and yet he could overpower you. You were... weak. He clicked his tongue. You know... Good puppies don't resist, right? His face came closer. I'll make you a deal. Make this fun for me and I leave the game. As a bonus, I even forget you tried to conspire against me. You felt your face heat up. The thanks to your fur, the blush on your face was hidden. But you could feel the heat radiating off of you. His right hand reached up, thumb gently rubbing your ear, while the rest of his hand wiggled through your fur in a pleasing manner. Jax hummed. 
Good girl, good girl. Now, let's take a look at your teeth. Your eyes widened as you felt his fingers on your muzzle. Carefully, almost gently, he pushed his fingers under your lips, pushing your mouth open. Thick salvia dripping out of your gaping jaws. Yet all that Jax did was touch, rub over your sharp, wet teeth. The bunny smiled. Well, looks like someone is taking good care of their teeth. <laughs> I do like that when women do that. You're right, I twitched. You felt so humiliated. With a smug grin, he touched your thick, leathery tongue. Your body shuddered at the sudden sensation. Jax liked seeing your reaction very much. His grin widened. Mm. I bet you want to take a big bite of me right now. Mm -hmm. Be the big bad wolf. He teased. Helplessly you struggled in his grasp. Jack grabbed your wrists, holding them above your head. Making you gasp. Come on. Be a good little doggy. Give the bunny a big kiss. You parted your lips. You looked at him. And Rex closed the distance. He was pressing his own onto the tip of your muzzle as he returned the gesture. He hummed as he became more demanding. Pushing his entire being against you tightly before he forced your lips open. You could feel Jax's tongue glide against your teeth, eyes rolling back, your legs becoming weak. Now pushing your own wet organ against his, your tongues met, as salvia tasting like sweet carrots. Your heart was racing, your mind feeling like it was about to shatter. This man was playing you like a fiddle. Like a dog toy. Here for his entertainment and nothing else. His hand crawled down your neck to the zipper of your jacket. Slowly he pulled it down. The sharp noise it produced making you shudder. Finally, he moved his head back. A thick, long string of salvia connecting your mouth. The closet by now reeking of your shared animalistic musk. I'm pretty sure those ten minutes are over, he said casually. But you gritted your teeth, filled with anger and desire. Your thick claws now were taking hold of the rabbit's shoulders, digging into his body. Careful, your pupils are turning into hearts. I'm going to write you, rabbit, until next week, you barked, probably out enough that the characters outside could hear it. He grabbed his overalls, and easily tore them to shreds. Sleep was important, be it in the real world or the digital one. In reality, sleep was used to reset a person's brain while gaining a huge boost in energy. While in the digital circus, it was used to pass the time or to have a routine, so you wouldn't abstract. Though occasionally, through what some of the formerly human characters called 
bad RNG, a character would require sleep for specific reasons. In your case, sleep was a detriment. As when you had first manifested, you found that you were unable to move at all. Sure, you could feel your body, but it was as if your muscles had been replaced by concrete. The pose you had spawned with was uncomfortable too. You were on the tips of your toes, arms stretched up into the air. And so you had remained for a few hours until that day's show began, when you were revealed as a new character. Though still, you just stood there, frozen, until the ringmaster came, had an idea. He flew behind you, and you could feel something enter your back. Your eyes widened as you heard a clicking noise in your ears, as the metallic object began to twist and turn. Each click flooding your body with a wonderful feeling, a wave of energy. After the tenth click, you could move your hands. After the twentieth, you could move and turn your head. It was a long process that was making you very impatient. Thankfully, Ragatha, a doll-like digital circus character, had taken it upon herself to introduce you to your new reality. As Cain vigorously turned the thing in your back to feed you. By the time Ragatha finished her explanations, your fear and surprise had been replaced with melancholic depression. You adjusted surprisingly well to the new reality, but your body still was fighting you at every turn. In this digital world, you had stayed mostly human. Honestly, even though you didn't remember your human self, in a good way too. You would call your new body pretty, and that was a feeling that felt new. As if, in the real world, you hated your appearance. You were a beautiful ballerina toy. While your skin appeared to be white porcelain, it was actually soft and a little squishy too, but being quite firm when tensing your muscles. In your room were a vast selection of beautiful white ballerina gowns and even some yoga outfits. Something that made Ragatha seethe of jealousy as all she had were the same light blue dress. Your hair was brown and reached down to your shoulders. You kept it tightly secured in a ponytail, though. Your eyes were blue and surprisingly detailed, for the digital circus at least. Your hands and feet dainty and fragile looking. But above all, on your back, you had a large, gaping black hole, in which fit a key that needed to be turned every once in a while for you to retain your mobility. Effectively, you had turned into a music box ballerina toy. It seemed to be the cruelest of jokes. You felt pretty, beautiful even, and yet still your body managed to be your number one enemy. Your name in this world was Dottie, and I'm given to you by Kane's slot machine on its fourth attempt. It was the first one that didn't sound like random letters strung together, and it sounded decently pleasant. Your problem is had arisen on your first night. Well, yes, the concept of time didn't really exist in the digital circus, night was considered the first eight hours after an adventure had been finished. During this time, everyone retreated to their rooms for comfort. But for you, this time was scary. As during those eight hours, there was no one to wind you up. Luckily, usually by the time everyone awoke, you still had enough movement inside of you, so you could just barely leave it to be wound up by someone. Usually Ragatha or Pomni. The two girls seemed to be the most helpful. However, today was different. Today, 
you had fallen asleep. Normally you would spend the time awake listening to the terrible circus music, playing with blocks scattered around your room like a child, anything just to keep yourself busy. But during the last adventure you had been done with everything. It had been a team-based adventure. On your team was Ragatha, Kanger, and Gangle. On the other were Pomni, Jack, Zubel, and to make it fair, Kane gave them Bubble as well. The adventure was a scavenger hunt mixed in with a bit of a creative exercise, where the pieces of the hunt needed to be put together to create the biggest possible tower. You ended up losing thanks to Jack's constantly intervening in your side of the hunt. Sure, there was no real point in winning, but when you spend enough time in the digital circus, any time waster is something to hold on to. And you started taking adventures serious. Really falling into a sort of role play here. Maybe it was your coping mechanism to not abstract. And so you had slept for the very first time in the digital circus. And when you awoke, you couldn't even open your eyes. All your energy was drained. It was like your first day again, just more scary. You were in your locked room. There was no one who had a key, to your knowledge. You were losing your mind quickly. The fear of never being able to move and the fact that your mouth was closed so that you couldn't even scream. The ever-present darkness. You couldn't see it, but... As you were screaming inside your head, your fingers began to twitch. Meanwhile outside, the others were in the stage area. Kane was making a headcount to start the adventure he had come up with. A fun idea called Comedy Night. Over the circus speakers, an NPC he had hidden somewhere would call randomly generated jokes. His personal favorite being, Why did the chicken cross the road? Weed eater! It just was the perfect joke to the entity. The goal would be to find the NPC and make it stop telling jokes so the characters would stop belly laughing. <sighs> Ken couldn't wait for them to hear the jokes. But with disappointment, he noticed that you didn't show up. Where's Dottie? She needs to partake in this glorious adventure! It was then Bomney and Ragatha realized they didn't turn your key today. The two girls felt absolutely terrible. It was the first time they had forgotten it, too. But at the same time, they did want to admit to anyone that they had forgotten you. And Bomney raised a finger. Kane? The ringmaster turned around to look at the jester. What's up, Pomni? Why don't you just start the adventure? Uh, me and Regatha can get Dotty and she can join us that way? Kane closed his mouth for a moment and thought. And then he jolted up. I accept! <laughs> this adventure is called Comedy Night! As Kane explained the rules, Pomni and Ragatha snug off towards the sleeping quarters. Do you think she'll be mad? asked Pomni cautiously. Uh, well, uh, how mad could she be? I mean, I, I, it never happened before. You know, it's, it, it can't happen. It's normal. Ragatha was deflecting to calm her own nerves. The two girls stopped at your door, ringing your doorbell. What if she's frozen and can't open it? asked Pomni, concerned. Please don't say that, snapped Ragatha. She's fine. Everything's fine. Everyone's okay. Nobody's abstracting. She rung the doorbell again and again and then twice. Finally, she took a step back. Sighing, she exhaled and then groaned. <sighs> we need Jacks. You cursed your body. You cursed your existence. You cursed the circus. 
Most, if not all, feelings had left you at this point, leaving only anger. You once heard Kinger talk about the five stages of grief. You had left denial quite quickly, because your anger knew no bounds. You were mad at Jax for making you so done with everything that you had fallen asleep. You were mad at yourself for not at least sleeping outside so someone could turn your key when they saw you lying there. And you were furious about the digital circus putting you into the situation at all. Time was moving insurmountably slow in your head. Seconds were minutes, minutes were hours, hours were days. Spending all this time in this black void, no sounds, no moving, no feeling. You were losing yourself every nanosecond, more and more. It was pure torture. If at least your eyes were open, you could have some input. Sure, it was the sensory overload of a super colorful digital world, but it was something. Now, this was far worse. Faintly, you heard the ding-dongs of your door, but you couldn't answer them, and this made it worse. Help was right there, but it couldn't get to you, and only made you more angry. <laughs> okay, ladies, watch the master at work. Ragatha rolled her eyes as Jax commented. All he did was steal keys and make copies of them. Remember the last time we did this, Pomni? The jester whimpered as she remembered her horrible first day. And Kothmo. With a smirk, Jax entered your room. The two girls close behind. Uh, God damn it, he complained. You're still lying on your bed, yes, but your right arm was leaking black fluid from beneath your fingernails. Jax's eyes moved from your body to the girls behind him. An idea came to him. Alright, I'll be with you two in a second. He slammed the door behind him shut. Concerned, Ragutha and Pomley looked at each other. Meanwhile, Jax approached you, slowly, carefully. Dotty, 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 it's um, been a couple of hours. You're already abstracting, just so you know. You could feel your nerves tense up. Wait, you were abstracting? This is how it felt? Wait, you were abstracting? No, that couldn't be. It were just a few... Uh... Hours? Maybe days? That you had been here? Lying? No, your mind wasn't this weak. You could hear Jax come closer. And that's when your arm cracked up, painfully. As pain fluttered through every synapse of your being. Like a feral snake, your arm twisted and broke as it tried to lunge at Jax. One mind-melting pain made the blackness appear white. He shouted, Hey, hey, it's still an early stage, you, you, don't, you don't have to be mad at me. He taunted as he dodged your snapping fingers. Just let Uncle Jax handle it, okay? Your arm kept twisting and glitching as it tried to reach Jax's throat. Early stage abstraction was when the body was still only turning. He couldn't fathom the amount of emotions you must have felt when you woke up helpless like this. It was enough for even him to feel something. He managed to jump on your back. Your nose exhaled a gust of air. You could feel his weight on you. It was so comforting that it made you tear up. He gurgled as your hand finally connected with his throat. Ignoring the pain, he turned the key. Once, twice, energy was returning to you, and so was hope. Each twist of the key made the grip around the rabbit's throat to lessen as you regained more control over your arm. And when it finally went limp, you raised your head, letting out your first scream of pain. It was unbearable. It hurt so much. Every bone must have been broken multiple times. 
Useless your arm was hanging from the bed. Black liquid still seeping from it. Okay, okay, hold still, I'm still not done here. Order Jax angrily. With the resistance of your body gone, he continued to wind up your body. Until the resistance of the key became too much and he stopped. I know your body had regenerated the many cracked bones in your arm, so you could move it again. Now, uh, do you feel... do you... Okay, now, uh, do you still feel like you're going to abstract because, uh, then I need to get gain? Oh. You muffled into your pillow. I don't think so. Uh, I didn't even know I was abstracting. Slowly, Jax let you sit up. And he winced as he saw your face. What? I think it's better if you don't leave your room today. You gulped. Why? You looked down at yourself. Your skin was covered in black, pulsating veins. Confused, you touched your face. Black tar covering your fingers. As you looked down at your bed, your pillow was soaked in it. With shaking hands, you grabbed it and threw it away into the corner of your room. Normally we're too late, said Jax with a relaxed tone. Glad it didn't happen again. Pony and Ragatha would hate themselves for the rest of their lives. And they'd probably abstract then too, shortly after. You looked over at Jax. He was holding a towel. He was holding a towel that he had picked up from your floor. Thank you. You said as you cleaned your face with a deadpan expression. I'm curious, how did it feel? You put down the towel. I was covered in blackness. <sighs> I didn't even wait for you to look decent to ask that stupid question. I felt anger. A lot of it. You put a hand on your chin as you thought. Actually, it was probably the most anger I ever felt. Jax nodded. That checked out with the angry scribbles all over Coffee's room. The cough more looked more desperate rather than mad. Well, I don't like saying it, but I'm glad you're okay. Skeptically, you raised an eyebrow. I mean it. You're fun to mess with. And I'd lose a great opportunity for fun if you abstract it. Ugh, of course. Jack's always thought of himself first. Though at least you provided him enough entertainment for him to give a rat's ass about you. That probably meant more than he could ever be willing to admit. Also, Jack reached under your bed, pulling out a bowl of candy you had collected over the months. You're the only one who has got a good candy supply. He took out a shiny red lollipop and began sucking on it. Dick, you muttered. Only for both of your eyes to widen in surprise. Dick, he said, confused. Wait, Dick isn't censored? Of all the words? You asked. That's awesome! The two of you started saying Dick like it was a mind-bending mantra. Until... Man, I love it when you say that. You blinked. Huh? Jack said without realizing it. He scratched the back of his head, embarrassed, and spit out the stick from the lollipop. Smart Leo grinned at him. And why is that? He leaned forward, his ears perking up. Well, chicks who curse really turned me on. You blushed. Though due to your still recovering body, your cheeks turned black rather than red. And Jax blinked, confused. What? Did I say something wrong? No, nothing. Why did he think that looked hot? Oh god, was he into emo goth chicks as a human? The cringe, he sighed. But he gave up. Leaning forward and cupping your chin with his right hand, he whispered. 
I just like it when you're blushing. Him saying that only made it worse. Hex, where's this coming from? You giggled, embarrassed. Do you like it? You paused. I, I guess. He pushed forward, pressing you down on your bed. Well, how about this? With a smirk, he kissed you right on your lips. Your eyes widened. He tasted like cherry from the lollipop. He moaned as he overpowered you, his hands feeling like they were everywhere. He wasn't giving you a moment to breathe. Man, your body is super soft, he said, with a surprised tone as he squeezed your flesh. You really are the most human out of all of us, aren't you? His head moved to your ear. So, little ballerina, is it also atomically correct? Uh, why don't you find out, you silly rabbit? You said before taking hold of his head and pressing his lips back on your mouth. His tongue pushing past your lips as his hands began to slide down your hips. His thick, cherry-flavored tongue met yours, and you moaned in delight. His sweet, sweet salvia made your toes curl and your heart race. You narrowed your eyes, smirking. Jax didn't know what he was getting himself into. After all, he made sure that you were... Really full of energy. Meanwhile, Pomni and Ragatha stood outside your door. Ugh, these jokes are really getting on my nerves, muttered Ragatha under her breath. There was a speaker at the end of the hallway that was blaring out the NPC's terrible jokes. M maybe we should get Jax and Dottie, suggested Pomni. I mean... Why is he taking so long? Do you think she abstracted and killed him? Ragatha gulped, immediately opening the door. Where she saw... your bed. With you... and Jax on top of it. Huffing, sweating, making deliciously lewd sounds. Her eye twitched. The two of you haven't noticed her intrusion yet. Quickly, she closed the door behind herself. Ragatha? I saw Jack's naked. What? Pomni, let's just go. What do you mean, naked? Ragatha grabbed Pomni by the shoulder, pushing her away from the door. Please, just stop talking. Just go. We have, um... An NPC to stop making jokes. Please. Thank you to the people who are supporting me on Kofi. You guys are keeping me alive. Today's adventure wasn't a good one. It seemed as if adventures inside the digital circus had only two outcomes. Either it was something mildly entertaining and creative, or a borderline dangerous chore. It felt as if most of the time, however, these adventures were specifically designed to torment one specific character of the formerly human roster. And today's adventure was no exception. The second you saw the letters GUG appear behind Kane, you knew what was up. Today's adventure is GUG's new eyes!
shouted Kane. Gug was a ten-foot-tall monstrosity, an obese, violent creature that was just as dumb as it was hungry. Of course, it wasn't as tall as other creatures summoned by Kane, but Gug could still be a massive pain in the butt. Kane just loved his Creature of the Week shenanigans. Gug had sickly pink skin, almost as if his body was entirely covered in a rash. He had a toothless mouth, which wouldn't be so threatening if it wasn't for the fact that his tongue was akin to a giant yellow leech that just loved attaching to anything that moved. Gug had three eyes, and in theme of the adventure, two of them were missing. Excited, the thing sat on the stage like a giant toddler, rubbing its inflated belly and slapping it, as Kane explained that, today, Gug would once again be unleashed, and he would only vanish if the two eyes missing were delivered to him. The only blessing was that whoever carried one of the eyes would be spared Gug's wrath, so they could deliver it in peace. He even was so nice to grant a grace period of ten seconds after delivery, before Gug would go after them once again. Ugh, you hated Gug. You hated looking at it. But Gug, Gug loved you. And the moment Kane declared the adventure to start, he was after you specifically, hyper-focusing only on you, running on his fat, stumpy legs after you as he flailed with his flabby arms. Douglas! He shouted. This... Would be funny if it wasn't so disgusting, commented Jax, while he and the others discussed an attack plan. They split up into various sections of the circus while you just ran for your life. You didn't know where you were, but eventually you had managed to lose Gug. Conveniently, a door to the exit maze had opened up, so uh, that was a pretty good place to hide. The tables, the many rooms, the liminal atmosphere. Sure, it was terrifying, especially with a giant meat monster after you. And whenever you opened the door, you risked bumping into the giant mass of flesh. But at least you could catch your breath. You were hiding inside of an empty cabinet, breathing heavily through your mouth. You never were a good runner, and the only reason you managed to outrun Gug was the fact that you were keeping just enough distance from him so he wouldn't start crawling on all fours. Because, just like the digital video game monster he was, crawling on all fours made him even faster. Instinctively you calmed over your head, only to remember that technically you didn't have hair. Technically, in the sense that you couldn't really touch it? In the digital circus, your body had taken on the form of a quite attractive chocolate sculpture. You appeared to be great craftsmanship as well. You were finely detailed. A depiction of the Greek goddess Aphrodite, made out of delicious milk, black and white chocolate. The clothes you were wearing luckily were seemingly real. Your closet was filled with beautiful white Greek togas that perfectly fit around you and your curves. And it wasn't for the digital circus being a nightmare, you may even felt sexy in them. Your hair was made out of white chocolate that clung to your body. Your eyes were an intricate design using white chocolate and black chocolate. And your fingernails, while still functioning like nails, just much more brittle, were made up of almonds, shavings that grew back on their own. But it was thanks to the fact that you weren't just a hollow confection that made you relatively resilient to blunt force trauma. And thanks to your digital nature, your body didn't melt in the heat. It just got a little stiff when it got cold. 
and try as they might, as long as you were just being licked, you would not lose any mass of your body. Though biting could still lead to chunks being lost from your body. And that's why you were so afraid of Gog. The last time Gog was part of an adventure, it was called Welcome to the Basement, where you and the others had to escape a dark cellar with Gug wandering around. He had bitten your legs off, which luckily, coincidentally, made you just small enough to escape through a vent by crawling on your hands. Your name in this world was Nibble, as that was the first thing that had happened to you when you first manifested. Well, obviously the one person made out of chocolate would be nibbled on by the first creature spawned by Cain. But thankfully back then it hadn't been Gug. Otherwise, your name probably would have ended up being Crunch or Crunchy. You know, something stupid like that. You heard the unmistakable noise of an obese giant squeezing himself through a tiny door frame from somewhere on your right. The monster grunted and groaned, using his greasy body to agonizingly slowly squeeze through the opening. You watched horrified through the slits of the metal cabinet as Gug stopped right in front of you. He was sniffing the air, and he burped loudly, and scratched his groin before looking around. For a second, your eyes seemingly met, making you almost squeak in terror. But Gug didn't notice you. He just waddled past you to the left through another door frame. And that's when you realized something. Something you should not have done. You were in the exit maze. How in the hell were the others supposed to give him his eyes back so he could despawn? Crap. That might have been a good idea at first, but now... This... This sucked. You slapped your own cheeks to hype yourself up. You were a strong little chocolate statue. You weren't afraid. That's at least what you told yourself as you got an idea. And with a loud triumphant huzzah, you jumped out of the cabinet. The monster, which was halfway stuck through the door, turned to face you. Chocolate! He lamented as he pushed against the wall with his massive arm to get loose. You took a few steps away from Gug, towards the door he had entered. This was going to be a long day. Once Gug became loose, you ran for the door. He huffed and puffed as he tried his best to keep up with you. The best way out of the exit maze was to run through as many doors as possible, specifically in the opposite direction of whence you had entered. While that may not immediately lead to the play area, it at least wouldn't lead to the void where you'd instantly be devoured by Gug, and then he'd be lost in space and time. That was a terrifying thought. Though the first problem of your valiant plan was the distance between you and Gug. Only three rooms passed, you were actively taunting him to follow you, that he went on all fours. <sighs> Thankfully he wasn't fast enough yet to just break through the walls, but gradually he was gaining on you. It was like running from a freight train. A freight train with a greedy, stinky mouth. Thankfully, Gug wasn't intelligent enough to use his enormous grabby tongue to get you. He just kept licking his lips whenever the flow of thick salvia in his mouth became too strong. Finally, he opened the right door at the end of a long, carpeted hallway. But that also led to your next problem. You were above the stage area. From here you could see the others. They were gathered around the stage, 
Jack standing there juggling the two slimy eyeballs in his hands while King clapped his hands in enjoyment. Pomni was the first one to notice you. Guys, look! She shouted. But that's when they heard Gok scream behind you. Oh god, she needs help, quick! Ragatha pointed at Jax. Quick, do you have a ladder or a blanket? The rabbit blinked. Uh, why should I have something like that? You always have something in your breast pocket. Oh, yeah, snickered the bunny man as he reached into the pocket of his overall, pretending to search for an item only to flip her off once he pulled it out. Guys, he's gaining on me! You shouted down to them. Just jump, said Jax nonchalantly. What? Jump! That was a mighty fall. But as you turned around and saw the giant thing barreling down, you sighed. Jumping was better than getting eaten, after all. But just as you took a step forward, and you were in a free fall, you could feel a sudden and heavy pull on your arm, and a disgusting, slimy feeling on your wrist. You looked up with horror, as your heart almost stopped out of fear alone. Your hand was in Gug's mouth, his massive upper half hanging out of the doorway, only held back by his giant oversized thighs holding him in place as they squeezed against the doorframe. You could feel his tongue glide over your fingers. Douglas! He mused. Oh god, help me! You let out a guttural scream as he was slowly sucking in more and more of your arm like it was a thick brown noodle. Here, catch! shouted Jax. You just barely had time to react as Jax had thrown one of the eyeballs at you. And you almost dropped it too. It wasn't heavy at all, but it was slick and slimy and quite big, so you held it on your arm like a mass of football. Instantly, Gog stopped sucking, just looking at you expectantly. Uh, you want this? He blinked with his one eye, before loudly spitting you out. From his mouth, you were shot towards the ground, crashing into one of the large decorative presents that were scattered around the stage area. Though the eyeball was still in your possession, luckily. It lied there on your thighs, as you were barely able to orientate yourself. Your vision was blurry, and your dismay, it seemed like you had lost multiple chunks of your body due to the crash. Half of your head, and the entire right half of your torso. You had only one arm. Yet bravely you looked up at Gak who was wiggling himself loose. Jack stepped next to you. The second eyeball in his hand, like a wet towel, Gak splattered on the ground before wobbling over to the two of you. He stretched out his massive hand. Jax was the first to put the eye in the monster's palm. After it was popped in, it was your turn. You watched in disgust as that one two he shoved into his last empty eye hole. Guck turned around, triumphantly wobbling his arms. And just like that, with no pop, no poof, no fade, he was just gone. Like he never had been there to begin with. Honestly, it was a little unceremonious. It was like using the delete console command in a Bethesda game. Huh. Well, that was boring, said Jax before turning to the others. So, how about we put her back together before we get Kane and tell him the adventure is finished? It were Kanger and Gangle who carried you into Jax's room, while Pomni and Ragatha were holding your pieces in their arms. Your fellow characters placed you down on the bunny man's bed. 
when he then pulled out his secret stash of sweets. Using nougat cream to glue your pieces back together. Meanwhile, the others had left to find Kane, so you were alone with the purple bunny. Almost too carefully, Jax was repairing your shattered body. It made you a little uncomfortable. You weren't used to the bunny being so gentle with you. Why are you doing this, Jax? You asked curiously. Hmm. This, putting me back together like this. He snorted. <laughs> What would you prefer? If I shoved you inside a furry suit and hope for the best? You deadpanned. What? It's a joke. A little reference. He scoffed. I mean. It's you who always has an agenda. Of course, I'm a little nervous. Jax's smile widened.、Oh, well, to tell you the truth, it's because of your great help in, you know, keeping me from extracting. Your eyes widened, and while you could feel heat rise in your cheeks, thanks to your literally delicious body, you couldn't blush. Ha, <laughs> ha, our little um. Anti-abstraction ritual. I get it. You said quietly. Despite what your body was made out of, it was still soft, and squishy to the touch, like human skin. At least, while inside the warm living quarters. It had been during your third day, when Jax had first suggested it. And on your twentieth day, was when you finally caved to his suggestions, as that when you had first encountered an abstracted being. You forced a smile. I mean, it's not like I don't enjoy it too. Jack smirked. Without warning, Jax kissed you on the lips, trying as much as he could to suckle in more of your flesh. The delicious taste of your chocolate covering the inside of his mouth. You parted your lips, allowing his tongue inside you. Of course, you weren't in love, but you enjoyed each other's company like this a lot. And the feeling you got whenever he lapped his tongue across your body—maybe it was because you were made out of chocolate that you liked it so much. Greedily taking in the taste of your sweet, sweet skin. Was incredible. You wanted Jax to go further, but as he pushed against your shoulder to climb on top of you, your arm slid off to the side. With a thick string of chocolate-covered salvia connecting your greedy mouths, the two of you looked at your stump and then back at your faces. Oops,、uh, sorry about that," he said with a grin. And after that hilarious encounter, he continued repairing you. And as he put the final pieces back into your thigh, he jumped up. Well, let's get to the others. We can continue this later tonight, when you're no longer in danger of breaking apart. You smirked as you got out of bed. <laughs> Sounds like someone wants to be rough tonight. You joked. Maybe. Just wanna see if my repair sold. It was probably Kane's worst adventure yet. 
You and your entire group of characters had woken up a couple of days ago, lying on a gravel path that led to the most stereotypical looking Japanese high school you had ever seen. If anything, it looked like a store brought video game asset. Cherry blossom trees were scattering their petals everywhere, and the sun was seemingly permanently stuck on. It's as bright as midday, but you can tell it was definitely morning brightness. The air was warm and somewhat moist smelling, and the wind was just strong enough to make yours and Ragatha's hairs move in the wind. There was no description given, and Cain was nowhere to be found. Also, everyone had been dressed in Japanese school uniforms, which was especially upsetting to Zubel and Kinger, as their digital bodies really didn't fit into the outfits. Especially Kinger, who was dressed in a skirt, because the chest piece definitely wouldn't fit into any real pants. Though he adjusted quite well to his role as female student, it seemed. Inside the building were hundreds of wooden mannequins, which usually Kane used as placeholder NPCs. Minus a single female student. It was you who immediately realized what this was setting up. This female NPC looked like a terrible 3D render of an anime girl with super long pink hair and black, lifeless eyes. Ugh. Of course she acted like everyone else at first, but it quickly became evident why she was here. She was the adventure. Luckily, you weren't the only one to notice, as you were sitting in the school's cafeteria. With the others, you were sucking on orange juice. Thankfully, Ragatha had managed to organize everyone to stay close to each other. There never was a moment where one of you was alone. I think we should talk to Kimiko-chan, suggested Kinger. Maybe she'll understand our caution. Jack's deadpan. Nah. You scoffed. <laughs> if she's what I think she is, that would only screw up whoever she's targeting. Through a simple game of eliminate everything that didn't make sense, the group had unanimously agreed that the female student NPC was going to be a yandere. She was always alone, got super fidgety around Jax, who you noticed was the only male student who wasn't a placeholder NPC, and she always glared at you and the other girls. Plus Kinger. In a very obvious manner. That was also the reason why Jax was right now enjoying all the attention. He was leaning against the cafeteria bench, with the reluctant Pomni and Ragatha leaning against the shoulders. Just so there were more targets that could be targeted, and nobody could be singled out. But everyone was getting super sick of pretending to be head over heels for the bunny man. Why can't we just kill her? grunted Zubel. That would end the adventure immediately. You shook your head. Nah, then this will just turn into some paranormal ghost type thing. So what do we need to do? She barked. The take apart toy woman was getting quite upset at the seemingly never ending adventure. And quite frankly, sitting all day in the classroom was bothersome with the faceless wooden dolls that repeated the same three lines when spoken to. Ugh. Of course, you had an assumption as to what would continue the adventure, but you didn't feel like bringing it up, as you didn't feel like being bait. But if you were the one to suggest the solution, you'd also have to be the one to do it, as you'd know how to pull the strings. You tapped your fingers on the table, gazing over to Kimiko-chan. 
Her eyes were widely staring at the back of Jax's head. What if Jax dates her? This was the third time Ragatha suggested this. Ew. Complained Jax. You could at least pretend like you find me attractive. Guys, we talked about this, you said. Then we still become targets as we are romantic rivals. <sighs> you guys don't know anything. You sighed. Besides, I'm the first one who was suspicious of her, so I'll probably be the first target anyways. You said that before thinking, and now all eyes were on you. What? Then you die, Jax. A blush covered your face as you puffed up your cheeks. Hell no! Come on. I'm not that bad. Angrily, you pouted. We gotta move on the adventure somehow. Jax winked at you. The bunny man had his eyes on you ever since you spawned inside the digital circus. As you yourself were a bunny person too. You were a little smaller than Jax, of course, and had a luscious feminine body that was covered by thin, short, white fur, almost making it look like skin from afar. Your nose was an adorable pink little triangle that quickly moved up and down when you were agitated and breathing. And the pelt around your cheeks turned red whenever you blushed, just to make it more obvious, almost as if Kane intended it. Your eyes were floppily hanging down behind your back, like pigtails, and you had short white whiskers, and an adorable puffy tail that pushed up your skirt all the time, it was quite a hassle to keep down. Unlike Jax, though, you had a more bunny-typical mouth with a slight overbite. Uh, you occasionally bit your tongue still. And you had big, round, red albino eyes. Your name in this world was Jazz. You bit your lower lip, maybe a little too hard. It hurt. You really just wanted to get rid of this uniform. Normally in the digital circus you wore a navy blue coverall that was incredibly comfy. And honestly you were making plans on buying one or two once the digital circus decided to show you how to leave it. Though with everyone looking at you and having accidentally sputtered out just how much you understood about the scenario you were in, uh, there was no running away. You just had to be the bait. You sighed. <sighs> Fine, Jax. We go on a date. The purple bunny man jumped up. With one foot on the table, he shouted. Have you heard, everyone? Me and Jazz? We're going on a date! The wooden puppets clapped their hands together and you narrowed your eyes as you peeked over at Kimiko-chan. Her eyes, too, were narrow slits. Your heart jumped. You knew it. This was a yonder story. And confidently, you smiled. Now, the plan could get started. As reluctant as you were, after the bell rung to indicate the end of the school day, you got up and joined Jax outside on the path leading to the town your school was in. Since the days never ended so far, it was concerning to see that the sun had progressed. Nervously you looked up, only for Jax to grab your hand. Which made you look at him. Remember, you're the one in danger here. Right. The town had everything a town needed. Minus the humans, of course. It was all just wooden mannequins. But they functioned. They even spoke. Sure, two, maybe three lines at best. 
Ugh, and you heard the countless times. Good morning, sweetie. Here's breakfast. For your mother and Percy since you arrived here. Oh, God, the breakfast was terrible as well. Though, now that you knew that one of them was after you, it felt more eerie. So, Jax, where will we go on a date? He chuckled. <laughs> There's really only one spot here. During your explorations, you had discovered three primary landmarks in this screwed up town, outside of the high school, of course. It were a general store that only sold school supplies, a library which sold books advertising various skills from cooking up to sword fighting, and finally a cafe called Star Canes. The reference being obvious. The only place where at least a familiar NPC was present in the form of Bubble. Bubble was the cashier and, well, since she didn't have hands, she couldn't really do anything. So she just floated there, smiling, occasionally chuckling. It was clearly an indicator that, in fact, this was still an adventure and you were still in the digital circus. You sat down with Jax inside the coffee shop. He exhaled slowly. <sighs> so, what now? You rolled your eyes. To appease Kane, there was only one thing that could be done. Well, we have a date. You now sat down yourself, and Jack smiled. Why are you so happy? He shrugged. We're on a date. I thought I'm supposed to be happy. Uh-huh. A waiter NPC arrived next to you. Uh, what should we get? You smirked. Jax, what do you like? He blinked. He knew that face. It's the face you made when you were about to ruin someone's day. One of the reasons he gave you just a tiny bit less of a bad time. As I was mostly kicking himself in the butt. I like... something that isn't a coffee. Or more specifically, I'd like a coffee that doesn't taste like one. <laughs> oh, Jax, you read my mind. You said with a smirk. <clears throat> I will have a half caffeine quad venti, one pump mocha, one pump fry base, one pump white mocha, um, half cross hatch caramel plus half cross hatch hazelnut, Plus Italian drizzle swirl with half soy, half breath, extra hot, no foam, whipped cream, and uh, half of the shots upside down. Uh, I'd also like ristretto on the decaf, uh, make it long on the regular, and two scoops of vanilla bean powder. Jax blinked. He had no idea what the hell you just said, but... Halfway through your order, the mannequin had started shivering. What the... F was that even coffee? You shrugged. I call it coffee, but it might as well be a warm milkshake. The mannequin then reluctantly turned its attention to Jack's. But before the bunny could say something like, I take the same, you grabbed the NPC's wrist ordering for Jacks. He takes a venti tread mister with 12 pumps white mocha, 12 shots coconut milk and extra caramel drizzle and adds some whipped cream on top of that. Jax furrowed his brows. That didn't sound as impressive as what you had ordered, but still the NPC left dejected. Why? did you order so little for me? 
He asked you straight up and you giggled. <laughs> well, you wanted a coffee that doesn't taste like one. By the time all the shots are done, there's practically no room for the coffee. You're a genius. You brushed over your floppy ears. I know, you're talking to me after all. Smirking, Jax answered, Ah, don't get to fool yourself. We are still stuck in the digital circus and you haven't made an escape yet. You sighed, leaning against the chair. <sighs> I know. You looked at him. But it would be much easier with some help. Jax clicked his tongue. <coughs> ah, not happening. I tried way too much. And by tried way too much, I mean I annoyed Ragatha to the point where she just accepts most of my hilarious pranks rather than looking for a way out. Maybe if you went searching yourself, you would have found something. He thought for a moment and then shrugged. Nah, too much work. You scratched your head. There were a few things you wanted to ask him, but never had the opportunity to do so, as he was always in a jokey mood that made any serious questions sound dumb. So this was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. You cleared your throat. Um, like, so, I'm curious, do you remember anything substantial? Jax huffed. <laughs> you mean from before? He simulated putting a VR headset on, and you nodded. He thought for a moment. I want to say yes, and then just taunt you by saying, I won't tell you, lol. But, no, I don't. As far as I understand, when you get into the circus, you know something is wrong. You remember what you were doing, but not who you are, not who you were, how you even got here, and most importantly, your name. Do you remember snippets? Most likely, that's where that order comes from. You're not the one that you just made. But nothing to truly grasp who you were. Probably part of the torture here. You exhaled through your nose. Yeah, I know, heavy subjects. He muttered. I wanted to enjoy this. He almost sounded like a bratty teen as he said that. Do you think the others got Kimiko-chan already? Oh, come on, what did I say? I want to enjoy this! No, you tilted your head. You mean you wanted to go on a date with me? He shrugged. Maybe. Maybe I like you. Maybe I think you're pretty cool. Maybe I was hoping there was... Something to talk about, but uh, considering the fakeness of the world around us and our lack of remembering anything, this is an indicator that there is nothing to talk about. And this was the moment you realized he had been crushing on you, and unintentionally, you blushed. It was nice to hear that you were desired, even if you were a silly looking furry rabbit. Well, there's one thing, you said. And Jax looked at you, right in your eyes. A feeling of familiarity that I get when I look in the mirror. According to what Pomni said about her looks, what Ragatha said about how she is a doll and all. It's a feeling that should not have happened. Jax nodded. He was himself completely blown away by the fact that he was now a cartoon bunny. He shrugged. I just think that maybe in the human world I had a pet bunny that looked similar to how I look now. You know, that's why it seems so familiar to look at my reflection. It's 
almost comfortable, but at the same time, it's kind of freaky as well. Well, you certainly freaked out less than the others to their new body. You smiled. You know, Jax, I never took you for a talker. Awkwardly, he scratched the back of his head. Uh, <laughs> well, I'm not... I'm, I'm not... I, I like to do my seducing with other means. He leaned forward a little, tilting his head and smirking. You know, like, coy looks. You burst into laughter. He was obviously over-exaggerating for a joke, but... Then he did something that made you blush again. As he set a hand on yours and got really close. And then I'd like to have some physical contact. Your eyes widened at his touch. But before you could answer anything, the Drix arrived. The mannequin was covered in sweat, but the overstyled drinks on the platter looked appetizing, as disgustingly sweet and synthetic they were. Jax took a drag and coughed. <laughs> oh, God! Women really drink this? <laughs> Be glad pumpkin spice season is over, he commented. And Jax chuckled. After taking another sip of the vile concoction, he grinned. Is it bad that I could get used to this? What, the drink? He shook his head. No, I mean... This. With you. Smiling, you tilted your head, a little shy. <sighs> You're serious, aren't you? Jack nodded. Maybe... Maybe after the adventure, you know, we could... <laughs> Actually, now that I have a quiet moment with you, yeah. Jax nodded. Maybe after the adventure we could, you know. <laughs> you chuckled. <laughs> Actually, now that I have a quiet moment with you, I think I'd like that. Yes. Somehow the two of you ended up staring into each other's eyes lovingly. I knew that in the nightmare circus, love could still be found. The sun was setting. You noticed it before him. The adventure is progressing. Ah, sweet. The both of you stood up, leaving behind a few green papers. They were Kane's interpretation of money. Leaving the shop, the two of you walked hand in hand aimlessly through the town streets. The problem was that both of you almost forgot the danger posed by Kimiko chan. Um, Jazz? Was this park always there? commented Jack suddenly as he pointed at a gate. Following his gaze, you narrowed your eyes. Yeah, this is definitely new. That's a sign, right? I have the feeling we made so much progress we should take the risk. Otherwise this will just loop. The two of you cautiously approached the park. It was silent here. The fake city ambience that had been playing on repeat was gone, replaced by nothing but the wind. The park was big. Finally, something non-Euclidean, you thought with amusement, as it definitely was bigger than anything that should have fit in this part of the city. Though as you cautiously walked forward, Jax just couldn't help himself. 
He just liked what the starlight was reflecting in your eyes too much. Not realizing this was likely part of the adventure and that the two of you were in grave danger. Both of you sat down on a bench. Jax was wrapping his arm around you. You know what? I think I might even fall in love with you. <laughs> really? You said too quick to make it sound like a nonchalant scoff. Yeah. You just wanted to say the word love without actually sounding like you mean it. Mm-hmm. Say it. Come on. Jax. Say it. The bunny closed its eyes and gently placed a kiss on the fur on your head. I love you, Jazz. For a beautiful moment you were quiet, looking into each other's eyes lovingly. And then you purred your lips, allowing Jax to kiss you on the mouth. You exhaled. His lips tasted incredibly sweet. One of his hands wrapped around your rear, pulling you closer into him. And once you placed your hands on his chest, the bunny man lapped out his cartoonishly long tongue. Your slimy organs crashing as you hungrily sucked on each other's lips. It was almost the perfect kiss. It was exciting, making your heart pound. You wanted more. It felt so hot and so... Mm, you couldn't help but moan, at least not until you heard the noise of a stick break behind you. Almost in response, quickly you jumped up. Aha! You shouted. Jax himself got into a fighting position too, but just as you pointed at the silhouette in the shadows, four other shadows jumped it. Huh. You blinked. Looks like they were vigilant after all, commented Jax. As the other characters of your group were mercilessly beating the crazed Yandere who had been rushing towards you the moment Jax had said the word love for the first time tonight. Uh, stop gawking at us and help us, grunted Zubel. As the anime girl's hand was pushing into her face with one finger poking her eye. Shrugging, Yun Jax joined in, kicking the helpless Yandere. At least until, with the simple snap of the fingers of Kane, he teleported everyone into the digital circus's stage area. Though everyone kept kicking for a few seconds, which by now was just air. Ahem. Take that and that, you edgy bi- Ahem, everyone? Finally, Kane got everyone's attention. And finally, you and the others noticed that you were back in the more normal digital circus tent. Kane stood on the stage next to him, Kimiko-chan, Though what upset you and obviously Jax and Zubel, who were trying to deal as much damage as possible for every kick, she looked fine and completely unharmed. Well, that was disappointing. Kane was talking about how this adventure was supposed to be a detective horror story with Kimiko-chan strategically killing everyone, but the final girl, Kimiko and Jax... The dead characters after each death would then reappear in the circus, and that made Zubel incredibly upset. After all, the toy woman didn't want to participate in the first place, and according to her, 
All she had to do was pretend to want to ride Jax's purple bunny beep and she wanted to get out. She was so upset she slapped you. But nevertheless, the adventure was over. And according to the disappointed Kane, before it even started. Still though, everyone was still rewarded with the typical feast. It was late at night. Night usually being the first eight hours after an adventure. When you climbed out of bed. Ditching your coverall for convenience. You snuck out, unclothed, with a heavily beating heart. Walking past the sleeping quarters until you stopped at Jack's store. You click the buzzer, and two minutes later, the bunny man opened the door, looking down at you with widened eyes. So, Jax, I was wondering, you said as you seductively squeezed your chest in front of him, if maybe you'd like to continue where we left off? He chuckled. <laughs> well, Jazz, there is one problem. What if I just said no and slammed the door shut? You're right, I twitched at the thought. I would probably abstract right the second. You're not gonna do that, right? Again, he looked you up and down, making you feel like a piece of meat. Though, somehow you didn't mind it. Jack shrugged. Come in. My bed is warm. And my body soft. Jack's lied awake in his bed. Staring up at the ceiling. Something had happened during today's adventure, and it just didn't let him rest. The money man blinked. Was he worried? Yeah. Yeah, he was actually concerned for something other than himself. He felt strangely vulnerable, despite knowing the only danger here was his own mind. He should just stop thinking about it, but he couldn't. At the same time, Jax knew if he kept thinking about it, he would probably abstract. It had been a pirate-themed adventure. He and his crew of scallywags were made up of Ragatha, Kanger, and you. For the event, Kane pulled no punches. It was beautifully animated water. Sea shanties and treasures were plenty. Of course, Pomni, Gangle, and Zubel, and just to have an even number of pirates, Kane had given them one of his NPCs, Bubble. They're on a different crew and therefore a huge danger to the plunder. They had been on sea for multiple days and nights, treasure chests piling up safely inside of the brig. It had been fun, actually. The randomly generated islands of the sea were filled with food, dangers, and gold. And was just something super different to do from regular adventures. It was on the third day when from the crow's nest you had shouted, There they are, Captain! There was a ship on the horizon. And judging by its slightly smaller size and colorful sails, that was not an NPC ship. Confidently, Jax had ordered everyone to their positions. Kinger was put on cannon duty. All he had to do was care about shooting. While you and Ragatha did your best to keep sails at the reasonable positions and fixing any holes and water that filled the brig. Jax's only goal, meanwhile, was maneuvering the ship in a way that allowed for a full broadside as often as possible. But things were becoming a mess quickly. 
It was only through the mistakes made on what Jax considered the enemy ship that they were winning. But that's when he was hit by a cannonball. Right in the face. Throwing off the ship into the turbulent waters. Water filled the bunny man's lungs. His head felt like it was splitting apart. With all his might, Jax tried to swim upwards, not realizing that thanks to the clouds created by the cannon fire, he was actually swimming deeper rather than towards the top. His lungs screamed for air, and his vision became blurry as he heard the faint meowing of a cat, followed by his own voice and the clapping of hands, like an echo from the past. And seconds later, Jax only saw black. The bunny man blinked at the memories. He of course didn't want to think about this. After all, it made him feel bad. And whatever made him feel bad, he didn't care about. But he couldn't stop himself. No matter how hard he tried. After the adventure that still ended with his team winning, all by without him, as he had game over it, and just woke up inside the regular digital circus, still wet and in his pirate getup, he stood proudly next to Jax and the others, as Kane congratulated you and your success. It was then he teleported one of the chests onto the stage. You recognized it as one of yours. The treasures secured by Jax's band of Scalywax were filled with chocolate coins. Actually, they all were. But isn't that great? Everyone looked at each other. Minus Jax, who just stared at the floor. Normally learning that the great treasure you found on a multi-day voyage through treacherous waters was actually just fancily packed up chocolate pieces would lead to a deadly mutiny but not in the digital circus. As you looked around yourself, everyone was smiling. <laughs> and so were you. Chocolate coins shared between everyone was a great way to survive. Food was normally only given after adventures in the form of a feast, and while yes, hunger wasn't felt in the digital circus, it certainly was a good way to waste some time. And now everyone had a little chocolate stockpile to waste time with. To you and your fellow pirates, this was great plunder. But that's when you noticed the lack of enthusiasm in Jax's face. During the adventure, you had gotten close. Well, sort of. Inside the digital circus, you had become a strange creature that was a mix of a human, a cat and a bird. Your hands were exactly that. Hands, covered in thin brown fur that covered everything above your navel, including your arms. Your face was human, with super pale, almost white skin. Red harp shapes were seemingly tattooed on your cheeks. They glowed a bright red whenever you blushed. Your eyes were a bright orange, and your tiny cat slits in them. You had four ears, two cat ones that shot through your long, wavy hair, and two human ones on the sides of your head. All four worked perfectly, making loud noises incredibly distracting and frightening to you. Your legs were scaly and yellow, ending in sharp talons. And you had a cat tail that was covered in black crow feathers. Since your chest was humanoid, you chose to wear clothes. Not everyone could be like Zubul, Kanger, or Gangle, after all. You wore a large shirt that changed colors whenever you blinked, and red shorts that reached just past to where the human skin changed to the scaly bird skin. Your name in this world was Kitty Hawk, 
Since there was no such thing as first or last names in the digital circus, everyone either called you Kitty or Hawk or both. Though you preferred the full name, Kitty Hawk. It sounded cool. And you like Jax. You had liked him since you arrived. Since your approach to the entire situation with the digital circus was to see it as being stuck in a video game, you had developed a cheerful personality. In your head, this entire thing would be over once you won the game. Uh, whatever the goal of it was. This was the best way for you to cope with this situation. But also this made Jax like you in return, as the two of you seemed to work perfectly off each other. He did a prank, and you were the only one finding it funny. You cracked terribly dark jokes that sometimes were very self-aware that he found absolutely entertaining. And one of your favorite pastimes was tormenting Pomni, who even now still had trouble dealing with everything. Her anxiety was through the roof, even though you arrived after her. And so it was no wonder you noticed Jax being... Not really himself after the adventure first. He had spent the entire voyage either petting you or firing you out of a cannon for fun. And of course, this allowed you to explore islands quicker. Now that you didn't feel his hand on your head constantly, you were just staring at him. During the feast, after the coins were collected, and as everyone walked over into their living quarters, he didn't speak a word. I reminded you of what the others said. Abstraction, that was the word. And it worried you. You gulped. And then, jumped on your feet out of your bed. Well, you thought, if Jax was sad and going to abstract, who better to help him than his beloved kitty? Energetically, you strutted out of your room and walked across the hallway to his door. First, you knocked. Then, you rang the bell. And then, you waited. And waited. And you were quickly getting impatient. Meanwhile, Jack still stared at the ceiling. The memory that was haunting him. Not even the ringing of the doorbell could get him up. Well, at least that's what the depressed bunny thought. But once the ring turned from short bursts to a constant flow, as you just mashed the button, he couldn't hold himself back anymore. Sighing, Jack stood up and walked over to the door. What? He barked at you. You're trying to sleep. His eyes fell down on you, as you were squeezing your chest provocatively. Oh, just you. Your cat ears wiggled excitedly. Hey, Jax, can I come in? He blinked. Sure. You followed him inside. So why are you bothering me? He asked directly. You seemed down. I wanted to cheer you up. He blinked perplexed. Jax didn't feel like the two of you had that kind of relationship. Then again, you always sucked at reading the room. And he wasn't feeling it enough to just kick you out. You sat down next to him on his bed. Jax had a very untidy room, just like his personality. But there was a method to the chaos. It was organized, almost as if it was specifically made to annoy a concerned mother. A sort of, I know where everything is until you told me to clean up kind of mess. Ugh, it felt very homely. So Jax, what's wrong? He crossed his arms defiantly. I'm fine, you're just imagining things. You purred as you pushed your head against his shoulders. I'm sure you are fine, but I'm asking if something is wrong. Jax rolled his eyes. I'm just worried you abstract. 
<sighs> Stop talking like that. Jax managed to suppress blushing. He could feel your incredibly soft, voluptuous body press against him, and it made it super difficult to think. And he really wasn't in the mood for that. He wanted to keep remembering, as painful as it was. He placed a hand on his chest, making the hairs on his neck stand up. Stop, he barked. I don't want to look at you. He crossed his arms, forcing his gaze away from you. And even though he clearly didn't intend it, his right arm glitched just a bit. A droplet of anxious sweat ran down your forehead. Jack, I'm serious, you said, the ears on your head tightly pressing against your scalp, immediately showing the anxiety you felt in this moment. What's wrong? No jokes. Probably a middle of a cannonball. You blinked, trying to suppress any emotional reaction to that thought. Though, hearing him say something as ridiculous as that certainly increased your heart rate a little, as well as making you blush. You could fear that wasn't it, though. His pride was turd. He might remember something. Something from way back when. And the more I think about it, the more sense it makes. You gulped. Jax? What is it? You asked seriously. Don't laugh. You're the last person I want to hear laugh at it. He looked at the floor. I think I remember my pet. A cat. The moment he said, pet, your stomach turned. He explained why he couldn't look at you. And a cat? I don't remember how she looked like. I don't even know if it was a childhood cat. Or more recent purchase. I do remember there was hand clapping. <sighs> Either way, I'm... <sighs> I've been in the digital circus for what I think is a year. Maybe more. And I... You put a hand on his leg. His right jittered a little as he rubbed over his face with it. Jax may be denying it. He may be fighting it, but... If you left him right now, letting him wallow like that, he'd surely abstract. A cruel, sadistic part of yourself was... curious. You had never seen an abstraction before. Of course, the rest of yourself was disgusted by your thoughts. I'm just thinking. What is my cat doing right now? That I'm here, unable to leave. His words conjured up images in your head that were difficult to just shake away. You exhaled sharply to not be affected by his words. The threat of abstraction fascinated you, but that didn't mean you wanted it to happen to yourself. Why are you telling me this? He looked at you. There was a hint of annoyance in his expression. Jax, I know you're intelligent enough to tell me anything. A lie. There was enough time for you to think, to tell me one. Or an excuse. Something that would be a hundred times sadder than this. So why did you tell me the truth just now? Jax knew what you were doing. 
They were giving him a way to let out his sadness while at the same time conserve some image of a macho. That was very thoughtful of you. I'll give you the same advice you gave me. Don't think about it. <laughs> I'm sorry, but that's terrible advice. Fine. Something different, then. What are adventures? Fun little distractions to keep us from going cuckoo, cuckoo, cuckoo. Ginger Liu climbed on his lap, his heart jumping as he felt your soft body press against his. And Jax, you whispered into his ear. In the digital circus, you do everything to waste as much time as possible. Spending any time on the life you lived and the life you want to live after you leave the circus will only lead to abstraction. His eyes narrowed. That's what I said to you. <laughs> and that's what you're not doing right now. He puffed up his cheeks in protest, but before he could retort anything, he felt your soft, warm lips press on him. It made his eyes widen in surprise. He definitely didn't see this coming, but he wasn't against it. Jax, though, hesitated. And he felt your lips perk into a smile as your breath brushed against his fur. The bunny gasped into you, which made you bolder. With your hands, you grabbed his wrists, forcing him to grip your butt tightly. Almost immediately, he squeezed, making you shiver in the light. You placed your hands around his head, pushing him down on his bed, before fiddling with the suspenders of his overall, gently unhooking them. Jax's hands moved up from your rear over to your hips, sliding up to your chest. Almost aggressively, he wrapped his fingers around your mass of orbs, still contained by your shirt. He kneaded the flesh below like Play-Doh, making you purr loudly. Your tail quickly waved around out of pure bliss. It was then that you smirked and leaned up, taking a hold of the bottom of your shirt. And Jack smiled as you pulled it off. Being awake in the digital circles for more than just a few hours could do a number on someone's mental health. The non-Euclidean architecture, the oversaturated colors for, well, everything, the wooden mannequin NPCs who just acted odd all the time, and the bright, invisible lights that prevented the creation of shadows. It was an overstimulating torture that should make the stay, that at least on paper should be very pleasant. No need to sleep, no feeling of hunger, and getting tired was only temporary as stamina was quickly regained by simply breathing. It was torture. And it was the sudden absence of any logic the human brain was accustomed to that was so damaging to the human psyche. After all, how do you explain the absence of hunger? After all, you're either hungry or not hungry. Or how do you comprehend not feeling sleepy even after 24 hours of running, walking, and in the case of the adventures, that can pan out for days by Ringmaster Kane, working? These weren't, of course, things your brain actively thought about, but smaller, minor details that crept up on you. This constant feeling of things being off, 
that wasn't going away anytime soon. That's why it was so important to your fellow character, Ragatha, to have a schedule. As the one thing that everyone was afraid of was this vague threat of abstraction. You had seen abstraction firsthand when Kalfmore went crazy, but again it seemed too vague. And without a one and done explanation, you just weren't happy. Though just grumbling all the time as you tried to make sense of something eldritch and otherworldly as the concept of abstraction would probably turn you into a boring, grumpy lady that refused any input other than her own. And, well, you already had Zubov filled that role. Well, either way, while abstraction was an interesting subject, you definitely understood that it should merely remain as a subject to talk about. Experiencing it abstracting yourself might as well be a death sentence. So you simply had decided for yourself that you'd be playing your role, while entertaining yourself with things you enjoyed in between. According to Kane, the digital circus seemed to have been created for the entertainment of an unseen entity, or maybe even entities, not himself specifically. And if these entities wanted to be entertained, you'd do your best to fulfill that premise. And hey, if everyone was set up with adventures, you might as well be the one who actually tried. Today had been another Monster of the Week type adventure. Kane had let loose an entity that hid in paintings, which was a problem specifically to you since the digital circus prevented you and the others from getting tired and sleepy it was incredibly difficult to go to bed and just close your eyes for hours and so you had taken up the hobby of painting as that was just boring enough to get you into a state of constant yawning as you really didn't have the patience to draw which was thankfully super easy for you as it seemed like the digital circus had given your body specifically for the activity. However, this adventure made drawing a danger. Your body had the appearance of a mostly monochrome clown figure, making you really stand out from the others and the colorful surroundings. You had a big black round nose, a short white bob cut wore silly balloon pants with long shoes that had small belts at their tips, a tight long arm shirt with three round balls as its buttons that accentuated your feminine figure quite well, and your fingertips, when taking your gloves off, ended in differently colored crayons. So of course, you had an issue with a monster that jumped from picture to picture. As according to Kinger, who always was a wealth of knowledge regarding the stuff, to defeat the painting jumper, the paintings the jumper was residing in needed to be burned. Only then the adventure counted as completed. And the threat of this devious little gremlin was gone. But what threat really was there? Well, you and Pomni were first to witness its evil nature. The creature had been hiding in a painting of a single banana inside of one of the bathrooms. And while Pomni was distracting the furious bathing mannequin, you inspected the banana painting. And suddenly, without warning, it changed into the face of a screaming, blood-covered anime girl. It scared you so much, you almost passed out. Essentially what this meant was that every painting now had become the equivalent of a terrible indie horror game with random jump scares. The next person to fall victim to the goblin was Gangal. She was curiously inspecting a painting inside of the living quarter hallway. And just as you and Pawnee were rushing towards her to stop her from looking at the picture, the man depicted in the painting stared at the hapless theater mask before jumping at her. Of course, since he was a mere painting, he couldn't physically reach her, but it was enough to make her jump and break her comedy mask as she hit the ground. As you were helping Gangle up, 
Pomni angrily stared at the now no longer haunted painting. Do you think we should just gather them all up? Asked the jester as her gaze shifted to you. But Gangle was the one to respond first. She sniffled and nodded. That sounds like an idea, she said. But that's when you blushed. Sure, you weren't sure if your own pictures counted as paintings the entity could live in, but you definitely didn't want anyone to see them. So quietly you followed Pomni and Gangle into the stage area, where Jax was relaxing under an umbrella with a juice box in his hand. Where did he even get that from? Where's Ragatha? asked Pomni cautiously. Taking a sip of his juice box, Jack shrugged a response. I uh, heard us screaming earlier. He pointed somewhere to his right. Can you please help us? asked Gangle. Uh, we're trying to beat the adventure and uh, we need help. Uh huh. He sounded very disinterested. Angrily, Pomley stomped on the ground and pulled at her head, but you stepped between them before anything could go out of hand. We're just, you know, going to set Beep on fire. Jax now looked at you before throwing away his juice box. Setting stuff on fire was all that you had to say. I'm in. Your group picked up Ragatha and Kinger from a nearby closet. Apparently the chess piece was so scared that he didn't dare to look at anything 2D. Zubal, however... Meanwhile, Zubal herself was completely boycotting the adventure and had just locked herself in a room. Oh well, not like you needed her anyways. Over the next hour, everyone split up into three groups. You with Jax, Pomni with Ragatha, Kinger with Gangle, to collect all the paintings scattered around the digital circus. If the art goblin wasn't caught easily as it teleported from painting to painting too quickly, well, might as well burn them all at the same time, right? Screams echoed throughout the entire complex for almost the entire day as painting after painting was taken out of room after room and placed right outside the digital circus. Exhausted, and now quite resistant to nightmarish visuals accompanied with mechanical screeches, you and Jack stopped in front of your door. Your hobby of drawing being kinda known among your fellow characters. Are you sure we have to do this? Jack shrugged. Actually, I don't know, but eh, better safe than sorry, right? Well, that's what Ragatha would say, at least. I don't really care. I just want to see a big old fire. Though as you continue to hesitate to open your door, for him, he just put in his own... He just put in his own copy of your key that he had made himself. Are you serious? You shouted in disbelief. I was about to reach for my own key and open it. You just, you just ruined the moment. He shrugged. Yeah, well, <laughs> too late. As he pushed the door open, he snickered as he pushed the door open. God, why are the girls' rooms always so tidy? He complained as he started ripping her pictures off the wall. Hey, you complained. I like it, Tiny. I hate stepping on stuff at night. Right, right. He tore off one of your newer pictures and finally cared enough to take a look. Even with the terrible wax crayons at your fingertips, they were surprisingly detailed. Maybe middle school to early high school level. Nothing to make money with, and clearly a lack of passion behind them, but they were serviceable. I'm more concerned with the amount of drawings you have. 
He looked at the walls. Well, I mean, this is far less than I anticipated. You bit your lower lip, a gray blush appearing on your cheeks. Ah, uh, uh, um, I, um, I don't draw that much. Right, right. You know, he tore off another as he spoke, crumbling the paper and shoving it into his overalls pockets. You seem very okay with this, by the way. I thought you'd be crying buckets over this. I vaguely remember the tantrum one of Kane's NPCs had when I accidentally touched one of his paintings with my hand. Ugh, it wasn't even dirty. He chuckled at the memory. Ah, uh, um, well, uh, some artists just aren't too proud of what they draw. Right. He ripped off the last picture. Anything else? No. He nodded quietly before walking over to your bed. Jax, uh, there, there's nothing. What are you doing? With an even smile, he reached under your bed and pulled out a large metal case. Seriously? You still haven't realized I'm talking about these? You fell down on your knees. How did you... I have a key to your room. And I saw you depositing them here a few days ago. Now, what could you be hiding from me that you don't want me to throw into the fire? You ran towards him only for Jax to stretch out his leg. You're running straight into his foot. Oh! His foot kept you far enough away from him for Jax to open the box. And the bunny's eyes widened. Whoa. Inside were pencil sketches, works of questionable art that had actual effort put into them. Though what they were depicting made Jax burst out into violent laughter as he held one up. <laughs> Do you really think it's that veiny? You whimpered as you fell to your knees. Um, size is pretty accurate though. Please, stop talking. Mmm, me and Pomni, as if that would ever happen. You know, her chest isn't that big. Actually, she doesn't have a chest at all. Jax, please. The bunny man was in comedy heaven. As he had discovered your stash of raunchy pictures, you drew whenever you felt like you were getting close to abstracting and needed to hyper-focus on anything but your current situation. Hey, 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 here's one with me and, uh... You. He stopped. There was a pattern in your raunchy art. And the art with you and him broke it. They were excruciatingly detailed when it came to the Fun parts were quite unromantic too, obviously only drawn out of sheer frustration, but the ones that depicted him and you, they were cute. Jax heard his brows as he looked at the whimpering mess you had become. With an almost unnoticeable frown, he put the pictures back in the box before kicking it under the bed again. Huh? I'm not going to burn them, he muttered as he scratched his neck. Only if the adventure isn't over by the time we burned everything else. Just, uh, I have a question. You gulped loudly. These pigs with me and you seem different from the others. Also, they are a little more numerous. He gave you a smug wink. Do you have a crush on me? He asked honestly and directly. Quietly, you nodded. I do. He sighed. Man, Kane is gonna be pissed. He chuckled. Shrugging, Jax got down on one knee. 
put a hand on your chin and gave you a quick peck on the cheek. In disbelief, you stared at the purple bunny man. The spot where his lips touched your skin, it felt so warm. But he didn't even say anything. Just walked past your stunned form out of your room. It took you a while to get back to reality. This had been way less humiliating than you had anticipated. If anything, you were a little aroused. Your gaze shifted from the door to your metal box. A lewd idea came to you. That in hindsight was kinda terrible, but hey, you are horny. Biting your lower lip, you sifted through the drawings, taking out the ones that you thought were the best, skipping the most experimental ones you did to a deep stack of lewdness. Almost excited, you then shoved the rest under the bed. Clutching the drawings with you and Shax, you ran towards his door, where you slipped a few choice ones under it, before hiding the rest back in your room. You then joined the others outside, as you burned the paintings and pictures collected during the day. You looked over at Jax. He was acting as per usual, completely hiding the fact that he had seen your terrible seductive secret. But once your crayon pictures were thrown into the flames, a loud gong echoed throughout the entirety of the outside, and the flames turned green. Oh, didn't expect that light show. I think that means that's it, shouted Jax as he looked at you and winked. Seemed as if your raunchy pictures were safe for now. As everyone returned to the stage area, Kane was completely and utterly exhilarated. He had expected the entire adventure to last for a week, but thanks to the as he put it, undeniable teamwork and friendship displayed by everyone today, the adventure could be beaten in just one day. He applauded everyone and spawned in a feast in the form of a chocolate fountain with fruits, but also a projector that showed an old black and white cartoon without any sound. Kane playing a piano in tandem to what was happening on screen. Well, this was surprisingly cute, and a rather great reward for finishing the adventure. Though, <laughs> the excitement wasn't over for you yet. As you thought about the pictures you had slipped under Jax's door, your eyes wandered over to him. He was devouring a chocolate-covered slice of honey melon, while his eyes were focused on the cartoon. <laughs> you grinned in anticipation. You hoped he'd get the message. But as you were lying in your bed, an hour later, after the adventure, you stared at your door. Your heart pounding so loud was almost deafening. But Jax was a no-show. Your cheeks blushed as you slowly got out of bed. Well, if he wasn't in the mood, you could at least get your pictures back. With shaking legs, you left through your door. But as you gently knocked on Jax's living quarter, its door slowly swung open, like it wasn't even closed. And your right eye twitched. Jax was lying seductively on his bed, one leg pulled up, overall pulled down to his hip, candle lights behind him. Hey there, he purred. Finally it's you. Ah, uh, what does finally mean? 
He shrugged. Pomni wanted something, but she fought me like this. Don't worry, she left. She slapped your hands on your face. Oh, God. It was like you were embarrassed for him. Well, why are you here? I, 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 um... You stuttered. Hmm. I assume you're not just here to draw me like one of your French boys, hmm? His seductive hum made your mind melt. You know, you could draw after the model for once. Or maybe experience it firsthand. If, uh, if this is a joke, please stop. Because if you just stop and start laughing at me, I, I don't think I could take it. He licked his lips and got up on his knees, pulling down his overall, until... Uh, you whimpered, putting your hands over your mouth to stop yourself from squeaking, your eyes wide in aroused shock. Well, does this look like I'm joking? <laughs> Come here. Jax was in love, but he didn't even know it. All Jax knew was his feeling of loneliness he had after a certain adventure. A few days ago, the Digital Circus had an adventure that for the first time put him in the position of the damsel in distress. The adventure was simply called Paranoia. But after the letters had appeared behind Kane, all he did was smile. He didn't explain anything, just floated there, menacingly. As the others stared at him, both confused and intimidated. Uh, Kane? asked Pomni. What does this mean? Kay's eyes shot towards the jester, quickly flying around her before returning to his mouth. It means that! And with that, he teleported away. Huh. Well, this is boring, grumbled Zubel as she already was on her way outside. The Ragatha quickly pulled her back to the group. Guys, think. Kane usually has an over-exaggerated explanation of the adventure. This time he didn't. A change in pattern is always important to notice. Her and Pomni were the only ones who were really worried here. Remember, we can't die in the circus, sighed Jax. Keep a cool head. Everything will be fine. It was therefore ironic, really, that the carefree bunny man was the first one to just vanish from the group. Though it took everyone quite a while to figure out how it happened. And if it wasn't for Jax's charm, it probably would have taken longer. As he had been taken by you, an NPC villain created by Kane himself. A tall, lanky humanoid with only a hint of a feminine body beneath a tight, red-hooded costume. You had long arms that reached down to your knees, with long, vicious nails coming out of your fingertips. Your eyes were glowing in a scary red, and your face, all by human, was covered by a white, scaramouche mask. You had a special ability. You could enter mirrors, like through an open window. And you could kidnap characters into the mirror world. 
Inside the mirror, everything was at a grayscale, a reflection of whichever room the mirror was positioned in. And so you had decided to make Jax your first victim. As the bunny man foolishly had walked past one of them, as the others were discussing a plan on how to attack the adventure. You were wrapping a rope tightly around the confused and stunned bunny man. It wasn't always that he was pulled into a creepy gray mirror world. The only thing that had any color here was himself and you. He grunted as air was pressed out of his lungs. Hey, he coughed. Watch for the merchandise, he chuckled. In response, you pulled the rope tighter. Okay, okay. <coughs> At least give me enough air to not pass out. God damn it. You narrowed your eyes, finally making a neat little bow to finish up his constriction. Jack sighed as he just lied there, unable to move. This was embarrassing. Almost cautiously, he looked around himself. You did quite a number on him. His head hurt, and any wiggling with his arms only hurt him more. He recognized the world around him, especially when his eyes shot towards the mirror leading into the normal digital world. Well, as normal as it got. As his eyes were instinctively searching for anything of colors. Grunting, he rolled on his chest, wiggling forward like a worm. God, how pathetic he was. But just as all he had to do was get up somehow and jump forward into the mirror, you stepped in from somewhere behind his peripheral. Without any noise, like a ghost, to stop his progress. You raised a finger and wiggled it to signal a smug no. Oh, come on. You could, you could at least tell me what's going on. You knelt down next to him, grabbing him by one of his ears, making his entire body shook. You whispered. I'm paranoia. You whispered. I've been created by Cain as today's entertainment. <laughs> well, I'm not really entertained right now, he growled. Oh, this isn't about your entertainment. Nonchalantly, you pulled at his ear, making him squirm in pain. His teeth clenched so hard he'd swear they'd crack. No one had ever dared to pull at his ears. And to his great shame, he could feel his body going limp. Like a female rabbit getting ready to mate. He hissed angrily at his shameful display. It was so humiliating. Thankfully, you find that go of his ears, leading him to sigh in relief. But as he rolled on his back to look at you, he only saw you lean down to grab him by the ankles, pulling him further into the mirror realm. No, he coughed. The bunny kicked and fought against your tight grip. He needed to stay close to the mirror for there to be any hope of escape. At least, this way the others could see him. Or, well, that's what he hypothesized. But as you slammed him against the wall, he knew that that was out of the question. Again, you pulled his ears. Who shall I take next, silly rabbit? Jax knew that you'd be pulling some psycho shit on him. Whoever's name he said you wouldn't take. 
So who would be the best to stay with whoever would then be left? <laughs> Ragatha. He barked. Offended at his ruse, you took a step back. You saw right through him. No one in their right mind would choose the most capable character of getting out of the situation to be taken first. After shaking your head, you cooed and replied. Skipping like a child, you left the purple bunny behind. It was an hour later when you returned with the package up Bragatha. You had wrapped ropes tightly around her ankles, wrists and neck, attaching the ropes to a big, heavy wooden cross. The doll complained, finding it very condescending as you lifted her up onto the ceiling letting her hang from above, like a marionette. From there, she saw the bound Jax. Oh, there you are! And Jax laughed in response. Hey, <laughs> hanging around, aren't we? Ragatha puffed up her cheeks. What is this freaky thing? And why doesn't it talk? Jax laughed. He watched you climbing around in her robes, like a ghost. She didn't even notice your movements. That's how light and silent you were. The Ragatha finally noticed your presence as your fingers dug into her shoulders. This is only the beginning. You whispered. But Ragatha just stared, horrified. She was so scared. She couldn't believe that Jax could see the situation so lax, especially since he was the first one to be taken by this thing that was you. It was much later. By now everyone had been taken. Gangle, Zubel, Kinger. Everyone. Except for Pomni. The jester was running around screaming for help, but she was running too fast. The jester by now had noticed your presence in the mirrors, and she kept her distance from them. As she tried to figure out the rules of what counted as a mirror you could appear in, and what didn't. Even though it was quite simple. Angrily, you stopped your pursuit as the jester ran into a mirrorless room. Furious, you had returned to Jax. You're getting sick of hearing the characters argue among each other. It had given you a headache. So you had spread them around the circus's mirror worlds. You understood the foolishness of that, but... Hey. There had to be some way how the characters could win this adventure, right? But either way, Jax had become your main target. He was... Too much fun to interact with, to toy with, as he tried so desperately to be smug. Hey there, he hummed as you crawled down from the wall like a spider, staring right to his eyes. Missed me? He somersaulted off the wall right in front of his feet. He was still completely taken aback by your 100% silent movements. Not even the cloth of your clothing made any sound. How do I get the Chester? You demanded angrily, furiously even. Seriously? You have trouble with Pomni? He grunted. She's a slippery one. By it, you mean how this adventure works. He rolled his eyes. Well, Pomni is a little twitchy, isn't she? At some point, she'll almost crack, but that's when she more or less accidentally starts doing exactly what she should be doing to begin with. So, uh, you kind of lost here. Jack smiled. 
You know, I didn't think she had it in her, but it seems like you just lost simply by selecting the wrong people to target first. Well, your losing was sort of the point, but you had hoped to at least be outsmarted by one of your captives. Ugh, this was a little disappointing. Though, Jax's words angered you even more. And once again, you gripped his ears tightly. He moaned. And you immediately retreated your hand. With a loud thud, he landed on the ground. Shocked, you looked at him. There was something about the limpless feeling that he liked, and you constantly tugging on him, that made him like it even more. Come on! <coughs> at least drop me gently! God damn! What was that noise? You hissed. And he smirked as he rolled on his back, looking up at you. I guess I just like being manhandled by you. Your eyes twitched in disgust and disdain. You're trying to take the fun out of this bunny, aren't you? Well, I'll show you. It was about an hour later when Pomni and the others entered the room you and Jax were in. She had managed to free every single one of them. Though nobody expected this. You build up to your maximum size on top of an unclothed Jax. Your painful claws dragging over him, making him wince, moan, and whine. And every bit of pleasured pain you delivered. You were enjoying all of his reactions. The little twitches, the little hums, the little curses that were censored by the digital circus. Uh, they all pleased you. They made your heart jump at every gasp, though... The others were horrified. They couldn't see the magic of this little encounter. Okay, Jax, should we come back in a bit? Asked Ragatha, annoyed. Seems like you were having fun, grunted Zubal. As you hissed, looking at them, before scuttling away in utter embarrassment. Your cheeks practically glowing with humiliation. Something you had never felt before was stirring within you. <sighs> Come on, guys! Half Jax as he reached for his overall. Guys! But the others had already left the room, annoyed and disgusted. Guys! With a leg in his pants, he jumped after them. Ah, well. At least the feast afterwards had been amazing. Though it had been overshadowed by a single issue that Kane almost failed to mention. He himself had no access to the mirror world unless he was taken there by you. And unless you left it while he was around, he could not delete you. And just simply getting rid of all mirrors inside the digital circus was a no-no, especially because Hanging up any new mirrors probably would attract you again. Ah well. With the adventure done, there was no reason for you to actually be malicious. Maybe it would be a little bit of fun. And what fun it would be. Over the next few days, every character reported seeing you in the corner of reflections. Reported your quiet whispers. Oh, it was amazing fun for you without the pressure of actually having to capture them in accordance to the adventure, and without the threat of being deleted, you had a freedom you didn't think possible. But Jax was hearing nothing of it. He felt as if everyone was making fun of him for what happened with you and him. 
and he refused to acknowledge any sighting of you he had himself in the mirror. Though, secretly, he had been collecting. The bunny man had taken a few of the mirrors lying around in the digital circus, and when no one was looking, he'd deposit them somewhere in his room. This feeling he had was egging him on, to bait you out of hiding, to see you again, fully, to feel you again, fully. If he knew this feeling was a simple crush, he probably would have stopped himself from pursuing this. But he didn't. He fought himself above these kind of feelings. He was lying in his bed, eyes focused on one of them. He stared at his reflection intently. And that's when, from the shadow behind him, he caught minor movements. His eyes widened, neck hairs standing up. As before, without making a single noise, you seemed to just appear, lying behind him, placing your head gingerly on his shoulder, almost playfully, your long scaramouche mask just barely poking past his cone of vision. You whispered. Jacks gulped, his eyes unintentionally widening. You slid a finger on his chin. Your white skin felt ice cold against his warm fur. He didn't feel your weight on him, but he could feel your presence. He knew you were nestled against him, and that made him blush. Why are you toying with me, paranoia? You're the only prey who accepts it. The bunny exhaled lustfully, as your other hand pushed underneath him. He could see a hand emerge from under his hip, taking hold of his chest, rubbing soft circles into him. I couldn't stay away for too long, could I? My precious prey, my lovely prey. He forced a smirk. Seeing it in his reflection, you pinched him with your nails. <laughs> you must be a fan of me, <sighs> but I haven't even seen your face yet. He huffed, your nails burrowed into his fur, making him wince in pain. But you didn't respond with words, but your reaction was everything he needed to know. He narrowed his eyes with the smuggest of grins. Finally, he found an opening to attack you with. Come on, show me, he taunted. He ignored your exploring, digging, scratching claws, refusing to show any reaction you could identify as pleasurable. You leaned further onto his body, using the arm you had to drape beneath him to pull at the nose of the scaramouche mask. With bated breaths, the bunny man lied there. But as you pulled it off, he couldn't make out your face. The red hood of your costume shadowed your entire face, except for your lower jaws, for your other hand was combing over his ears, making him shiver. Ever since you pulled at them, they'd become so sensitive to sound and touch alike. Luckily, no one had noticed a slight change in demeanor. 
as I watched you throw the mask to the ground, you felt a slight difference in your touches. They had become more... gentle. Your claws less painful. And your presence less threatening. He gasped when he heard a sudden loud click. But as he looked down, he had just undone one of his hooks of his overall. You really were a pervert, weren't you? Ah, not that he minded it. If anything, it made him feel like the two of you were a kindred spirit. Once the second button was unhooked and his overalls pulled down to his hip, he finally took the opportunity that he had waited for so long. With his entire weight, he threw himself against you. A gasp escaped your mouth, probably the loudest noise you had ever produced. And finally, finally, he took charge. Your long hands were held together by his fist while he straddled you, his knees pressing together against your hip, making you gasp. The bunny pushed his face against your ear. How does it feel, paranoia? He pulled away with an almost evil grin as he stared down at your helpless form. He finally could make out your face, too. <laughs> As it turns out, the red glowing orbs were merely the center of what were two big, beautiful eyes. Your face was painted black around them, like someone had crudely drawn a villain mask on your face. Your skin, however, as white as snow. He could see how soft it was, even in the darkness of his room. Almost like the face of a young teen. With his free hand, he rubbed against your cheek with a confident smirk. What did you just call me? Pray? God, you had such beautiful lips. He only now noticed that. They were red like lipstick, but when he seductively moved his thumb over them, it didn't smear. This was just their natural color. Your teeth were sharp, but he noticed that before. Not that he minded that. So, tell me, Who's the prey now? Of course, you were still an NPC. You weren't programmed with too much brain. So even in this exposed position, even as you could feel his warm, slender body push you down, even as his free hand was slowly dragging down the zipper of your costume, you couldn't comprehend anything but Seeing him as your prey. You are. He smirked. Do you want to know what I see? You wanted to grunt. That's irrelevant. However, one of his fingers pressed down your lips, preventing you from speaking. I see a little thing. Alive only because it's been forgotten by its master. But now I have the grip around you. And you will do as I say. Okay. Slowly, carefully, he let go of your wrists. Making sure to keep enough pressure on you so you wouldn't immediately fight for control. He took hold of the two sides of your costume, opening it up. You shivered as the cold air danced across your naked skin. Oh, I'm going to enjoy this. He hushed as he pressed his lips on yours, 
his hot breath cascading down your face as you were helpless against his raw dominance. Or maybe you weren't so helpless. Maybe, just maybe, you wanted this. Thank you to the people who are supporting me on Kofi. You guys are keeping me alive. Special thanks to AJ Anime Girl 85 and Hopeful for being my first channel members. Thank you for being darlings.